<laughs> okay, the live stream is on. If sergeants will begin their recordings. You see recording is started. According to the cloud all set. Backup is rolling. Okay, and Sergeant Polite, would you start with the opening statement? Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on the Committee on Aging, jointly with the Committee on Immigration. Will council members and staff please turn on a video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on a video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place your cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Menchaca, we are ready to begin. Buenos dias a todos. I'm Carlos Menchaca, chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. And we're joined today by Committee on Aging, chaired by my colleague, council member, and chair for today, Margaret Chin. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Drum and Ballone and Ayala. Uh, and as council members come in, I will, and or Chair Chin will acknowledge them. Today, the committees will be conducting oversight on city programs services and outreach conducted for older immigrant New Yorkers, for older immigrant New Yorkers. According to the Center for Urban Future, the older adult population aged 65 and older is the fastest growing segment of New York state population. In the city, it's the older immigrant population that's growing fastest, 42% over the past decade. Aging in New York City comes with a host of unique issues, not the least of which is the cost of living. New York City continues to rank as one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. And older adults often do not have a source of income that keeps pace with the rising costs of living. This is especially true for older immigrant adults as they are twice as likely to live in poverty and tend to receive far less government assistance through wages, social security benefits, private retirement accounts, and other income sources, if they receive them at all. Many older immigrants remain ineligible for these benefits due to their status or because they have not worked in the United States for long enough to draw down on benefits. Older immigrants also face significant challenges with regard to language access. The Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs has reported that 37% of older immigrant adults live in households that are linguistically isolated, meaning they have no one in the home above 14 years of age who speaks English well. This makes it incredibly difficult for older immigrant adults to access city services due to language barriers. And we have only seen this exacerbated during the pandemic with many seniors lacking English proficiency and digital literacy, even communicating basic information about the virus has been a challenge. And social isolation and language barriers only further exacerbate food insecurity during this pandemic, with food insecurity doubling amongst older New Yorkers. These are critical and pressing issues facing our older New Yorkers and especially our older immigrant New Yorkers, as we as a city must come up with solutions on how to best address them. Thank you to the administration for joining us today. I can't wait to hear about the work that Moya uh, and DIFTA are spearheading along with the Department um, uh, for the Aging, DIFTA, to ensure that our older immigrant New Yorkers are not forgotten. More than ever, we must prioritize resources to ensure population leaders in our communities who've devoted lives to us to their children and to our communities, that they are treated with dignity and honor. We have much more room for improvement and it must start with accessible COVID-19 vaccines for all. It must not end there. It must not end there. I wanna thank the administration and service providers for testifying today, as well as the staff who have been working really hard behind the scenes to ensure that the online uh, hearing runs smoothly. I'd like to thank Immigration Committee Council uh, for uh, staff for their work 
committee counsel Harbani Aouja, policy analyst Elizabeth Kronk, and my staff as well, Chief of Staff Lorena Lucero, Legislative Director Cesar Vargas, and Communications Director Tony Chirito. And with that, I want to turn over to my co-chair, Councilmember Chair Chin, passionate leader who does everything, every single day, to support the voices and the power of our older immigrant New Yorkers. Chair Chin. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Chair Manchaka. We're also joined by uh, Council Member Diaz Sr. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And I would like to welcome you to today's joint oversight hearing on older immigrant adults. I'd like to thank Chair Manchaka of the Immigration Committee for co-hosting this important hearing with me. It is not news that New York City's older adult population is growing. Older adults are the fastest growing group in the entire state. However, something that is often overlooked is that within that larger group, older immigrants in particular are growing rapidly. Over the last 10 years within New York State, the number of older immigrants have nearly doubled the rate of those within the US. In New York City alone, the older immigrant population has grown over 42% in the past decade. About 3.2 million immigrants, almost 20% are 65 and older. This makes older immigrants a group that we cannot ignore. While all older adults face age-related challenges such as health, ailments, mobility issue, affordable housing, food insecurity, and poverty, often these issues are seen at a higher rate in the older immigrant population. Within the older adult population, for example, older immigrants are 50% more likely to live in poverty. According to the Center for an Urban Future, immigrant seniors in New York City have a median income of only $9,900 compared to 18,300 of native born seniors. This is partly because older immigrants tend to receive significantly less than their native born counterparts from wages, social security, private retirement account, and other income sources. Older immigrants are often under enrolled in programs like Social Security, SNAP, and Medicare, Medicaid. And many older immigrants do not qualify for these programs at all. As my co-chair has already mentioned, another challenge for older immigrants is difficulty in accessing important information and essential services due to language barrier. Over three out of every five older immigrants in New York City identify as limited English proficient and more than a third of them live in household where nobody over the age of 14 speaks English at all. As a result, many immigrant seniors are unable to find interpretation for important information. This can leave older immigrants isolated and make it difficult for them to be connected to an often confusing and complicated system. Even when we do serve our city seniors, we often forget to take the unique needs of immigrant seniors into account. For example, the city does not always make all information available in a variety of languages and frequently fall short on providing culturally competent foods and programming. Many of these issues have been worsened by the corona pandemic. For example, COVID-19 has increased food insecurity among all seniors, but especially among older immigrants. Many of our COVID-19 health resources and information 
are located online. When older immigrants disproportionately suffer from lack of access to the internet. And what we have heard from advocates and community that some things as simple and important as vaccine and testing information is not available in multiple languages. This is not acceptable. We cannot leave older immigrants out of the conversation or out of the system. As older adults are the population most vulnerable, COVID-19. We must take extra step to ensure older immigrants are connected to the city's resources and services. We must make sure immigrant seniors have access to proper culturally competent meals, to technology, to remain socially engaged, to healthcare, and to critical information available in their language. At this hearing, the committee want to hear from Dicta and Moyer about what they are doing to help serve the unique needs of our immigrant seniors. We want to see how the two agencies work together, what services and resources they provide to the city's older immigrant population, and how they have reached out to this population in particular during the pandemic. The committee especially want to hear about how the agency and the city are working to vaccinate older immigrants. How are they having been reached out to? What rates are being vaccinated at? What must make sure our older immigrant community is not left out of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout and that they are connected to important resources and services at this difficult time. Finally, to our seniors watching this hearing, remember, if you are over the age of 65 and live within New York City, you are now eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccinations are free and available to all seniors 65 and older, regardless of immigration status. You can go to the website, www.vaccinefinder.nyc.gov to find a location near you and schedule your appointment for vaccination online. You can also call to make an appointment at one 877 829-4692. It might take a while, but be persistent. You must make an appointment to receive the vaccine. And as I said, you've got to be persistent because it's not easy. And if you need further assistance scheduling and an appointment to receive a free COVID-19 vaccine, you can call the senior center that you go to or other senior center that you know of or other DIFTA program. And let's make sure that you get vaccinated and stay healthy. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Our committee counsel, Nusar Chadari, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Sodini Sopora, and I also like to thank my director of legislation and communication, um, Kana Irvine. And I like to thank the other members of the committee who have uh, joined us today. Now I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Chaka. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Chen. And uh, it, it is something that is important that both these committees are looking at something that uh, just becomes invisible for so many of us. And so we're looking forward to our testimony from the administration. And I'll hand it to, I'll just hand it right now over to, um, to our Bonnie uh, to administer the oath. Thank you, Chairs. 
My name is Herbani Ahujan. I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panelists to give testimony will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then members of the public will testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelists have completed their testimony. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by DIFTA Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Nick Gulada from the Director of Outreach and Organizing at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Before we begin, I will administer the oath, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez and Nick Gulata. I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Cortez Vasquez? Yes. Thank you. Nick Gulada? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when you are ready. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. First of all, it is a good morning. I want to take this opportunity to say an early happy uh, Lunar New Year to all my colleagues. Uh, it is this Friday, and I did not want to forget, um, which is something that I do a lot lately. Um, so anyway, everyone have uh, last year's Lunar New Year was interesting, uh, Chairwoman Chin. Um, it was the beginning of the pandemic. There was a fire. And so we want this Lunar New Year to be um, not as eventful, but as joyful. Uh, so thank you, Chairwoman Chin, uh, Chairman, uh, Chairperson Menchaca, and the members of the Committee of Aging and the Committee of Immigration. I am, as you know, Lorraine Colte Vasquez and the Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging. Again, I'm joined today by my colleague, um, who I have the greatest respect for and admiration, uh, Nick Golota, who is the Director of Outreach and uh, Organizing at the Mayor's Office of, of Immigrant Affairs. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today uh, as someone from this affected community. I look forward to sharing information about our services, uh, themselves, as well as some of the personal stories of immigrant older adults who have benefited from the services offered by our vast network of agencies in the um, aging network. These stories are small highlights of some of the impact of the work that our communities do. I want to give uh, both of you cited some inform uh, population information, and I want to just delve into that a little deeper. According to the American Community Survey of 2019, there were 1.7 million, over 1.7 million older adults living in New York, accounting for roughly 21% of the city's population. I wanna just say that again. Older adults represent 21% of the city's population and, uh, and are expected, that number is expected to grow in the future. Uh, despite the onslaught of federal rule changes over the last four years, uh, which we all had to suffer through, uh, many of them targeted immigrants. Uh, New York City remained a destination where many immigrants, particularly older adults, were safe, and it was a, a harbor city. In uh, 2019, New York City had uh, 3 million foreign-born residents down about less than 1% from 2010. Yet this, despite this small decrease in the overall population, 
foreign born residents over the age of 60 increased by 33% uh, between 2010 uh, and 2019, over close to a million people. It was about 875,000 people. And the most popular countries of origin are now China, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. With the rise in the immigrant older New Yorker, there is great diversities in the languages spoken at home as well. For older New Yorkers, just over 47% speak a language other than English at home. That is almost close to half the older population speaks another language. This this is an increase of 2.6 uh, uh, from, from the earlier survey done in two, uh, 2010. It is also interesting to note which of these languages have changed. From 2010 to 2019, older adults who spoke Spanish at home increased uh, by 33%, while those who spoke Chinese, Mandarin, and other Asian, Korean, other Asian Pacific Islander languages increased by nearly 54%. 33% for Spanish, Asian, Pan-Asian languages, 54%. Additional languages other than Indo-European also increased by almost 49%. Within those who speak a language other than English at home, almost 32% indicate that they speak English less than very well. That may, uh, which is a slight decrease from 2010 which basically talks about the new immigration status. The population of immigrant older adults are usually not new immigrants. And that's one thing that I think we all need to re remind ourselves, that residents who are choosing to age in place in New York City, um, who, migrate, who immigrated between uh, 1990 19, and 19, uh, 1999, and then there was a slight decrease in 2000 uh, by 47% and 44% relatively, respectively. While those who entered prior to 1990 increased by 17.1%, which means that people are aging in place. Given the length of stay in the country, it makes sense that any overwhelming number of foreign born over older adults are also being naturalized citizens. In 2019, roughly 78% of the foreign born older adults were naturalized citizens, up from 74% in 2010. For the remaining 22% that are not citizens, many face challenges accessing benefits such as federal Medicaid for which they are not eligible. And you and I know that if you have an immigrant status and you've been working with a social security number, that is one benefit you will never realize. So you've been contributing and will never draw down on those benefits. Uh, reduced access to health benefits was exacerbated by the recent federal changes to the public charge rule, which added further restrictions for many non-citizens who might otherwise access public benefits while also creating a chilly effect for others who are not subject to the rule, but fear the consequences if they apply. Historically, the public charge rule had been used in the green card application process to ass assess whether that person would be dependent on cash assistance, uh, cash assistance from government, uh, from government uh, funded programs to survive. In 2018, the federal administration proposed changes to expand which benefits would be used to evaluate public charge status? It should be included in non-emergency federal medi uh, Medicaid, supplemental SNAP, supplemental uh, nutrition assistance, which is needed by many families, public housing section eight vouchers and Medicaid Part D low income subsidy. While using these programs does not necessarily preclude someone from changing their visa status, or getting a green card, they are they can be used as factors. The rule is currently tied up in the courts and, and it's currently under review by the Biden administration, but it is still currently in effect and it will likely take a while for it to be reversed. Despite federal policies, again, the, the Blasio administration, the city of New York has made it a priority 
to ensure that city serve, uh, the, the city provides critical services to everyone, including immigrants. Some of these services include NYC Care, which provides free health care to all eligible individuals, regardless of their immigration status, and mental health services through Thrive NYC. And during this pandemic, food um, and food hubs through Get Food NYC. It also offers legal assistance, including immigration related services through Moya's Action NYC and tenant representation through the Human Resources Administration. New York City remains a sanctuary city, full of accessible supports for those who need it, regardless of immigration status. We are optimistic about the changes in the federal landscape and look forward to a new pathway forward to all immigration, all immigrants. Much more can be done and much needs to be done to, to alleviate some of the fears. Uh, new York City offers a wide range of services for older adults over the age of 60, regardless of status. These services remain available and open to all New Yorkers throughout the COVID-19. In fact, the documentation question, the status question is not raised by any program at the Department for the Aging. All services follow the local guidance from local law 30 of 2017 regarding language access. This ensures that all written communication is provided in at least the 10, uh, the 10 languages um, and in addition to on-site translation, we have the telephone uh, translation, which offers 240 languages. And those are services have access to that also. Additionally, all services are provided in culturally competent manner. That is our goal. That is what we strive for. New York City aging staff receive cultural competency training in order to best needs the the needs of the diverse group of older adults that we serve. Many of our programs use their cultural competence skills to engage, establish trusting relationships, and to assist older adults and their caregivers access services that they would otherwise refuse or have access to uh, for fear of providing personal information to the government organization. We need trusted voices and we need trusted partners. And that's what we try to inculcate in our, in our agencies. The fear is also often due to their political, their social political backgrounds and distrust in government and organizations from their native countries of origin and fear of, of being reported for not having adjusted their immigration status. And that was really increased during the last four years. Case management is a great help to many immigrants and non-immigrants alike. Through this service, older adults receive help signing up for public benefits for which they are eligible, including Medicare and Medicaid, SNAP, Senior Citizen Rent Exemption, and Home Energy Assistance. Referral for other services are provided, such as assistance with house chores, shopping, and grocery. Um, there has been particularly in demand service during the pandemic as older adults have been encouraged to stay at home as much as possible. So we've seen an increase in our need for shopping assistance as well as in-home services. Additionally, New York City Aging supports older adults seeking new and different employment. Through this program, older adults have access to employment services, training and career counseling. This is the only program, unfortunately, which we have to ask an immigration status uh, because it is a federal mandate that we do so. Other services include elder justice, geriatric mental health, health insurance, our high cap program, health insurance counseling and assistance program, and our grandparent resource uh, center. During this pandemic, one of the issue areas that we have focused a lot of attention on is social isolation, because you know that social isolation has a devastating effect on all of us, and it has for the last nine months, but it has a particular negative and health impact on older adults. So we have included several programs to con uh, combat social isolation, including friendly visiting and friendly voices. 
all of these programs are now done uh, during the pandemic done on vir virtually through virtual visits and telephonically. Additionally, Friendly Voices Friendly Voices has been very active. Through this, older adults are partnered with a volunteer who checks with them via phone or video weekly. And, uh, and it, it's been expanded to include a, socialized, a socialization groups on phone or video after hearing that culturally many were not responsive to the one-on-one -on -one model. Matches were made based on language preferences. In addition to Friendly Voices, the New York City aging staff have been providing an average of 10,000 wellness calls. So when I say New York City aging staff, I'm talking about that vast network of 300 or more providers who uh, represent the wider range of communities in this city. Uh, provide over 10,000 wellness calls a day to older adults during this pandemic to reduce social isolation. These calls are made in several languages. One of these, uh, one of these clients is an immigrant from Jamaica from whom staff was able to establish a strong uh, trusting relationship. The older adult was living in a room in a basement house in Brooklyn under unsafe conditions without heat. She had just tried with without success to apply for senior housing. New York City aging staff was able to reach out to Derote, a local nonprofit organization's homeless prevention program, and ask if they would interview the older adult for eligibility for their privately funded shelter. This unique program has agreement with two highly qualified <coughs> quality assisted living facilities to accept referrals for, for their shelter when they have opening. At first, the older adult was hesitant to consider permanent placement in an assisted living facility as she did not see herself as being frail and had concerns about being confined to a facility. Nevertheless, she agreed to be interviewed by the shelter staff and was accepted. The older adult decided to accept a Rhodes offer and move into the shelter on December 2nd. That is one of the success stories. I wish we had more and more of those on a daily basis. Uh, New York City remains a vital resource for many of our older New Yorkers seeking assistance, whether it's finding better housing accommodations to a variety of older services <coughs> that department offers, excuse me. Over the years, uh, older adults are eligible to receive of uh, free meals, access to free meals through our home delivered programs, as well as through our local senior centers. And for years we have tried uh, and have succeeded to make sure that religious cultural uh, preferences are being attended to uh, for the populations that we have. For these meals, there's a wide range of meals option, including vegetarian, halal, kosher, Spanish, Pan-Asian, uh, which seeks to, to deal with the uh, dietary needs and the preferences of older adults. That, you know, that is one of those issues that we can always move more and we and grow as the population keeps changing, our services will keep changing. And that is why we, we look for the opportunities to create new, uh, uh, to look at the senior center of the future so that we could really move in that direction. Um, these meals are essential. And during the pandemic, we found ourselves with many more older adults finding themselves food insecure. And uh, we're really looking forward to roll out a re-engineering of senior centers to provide food in a variety of ways directly to clients. Um, and yes, uh, Councilwoman Chin, we are working diligently to bring back the senior center and the food delivery process during, during this pandemic. And I think that we may have real good news in a, maybe a week. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward with that much more anxiously, I think, than you are. Even with these meal options, immigrant older adults sometimes experience difficulty navigating the systems in order to access food. We know that. Recently, a resident of Coney Island con uh, contacted council member Tragas regarding their elderly non-English speaking neighbor, who they, uh, excuse me, 
who they thought was frail and alone in need of food. They didn't have any contact information. The contra uh, council member Traeger reached out to the local senior center, who then reached out to the Department for the Aging to help identify who that person was. Through New York City uh, Aging's STAR program, the database, two adults were identified and contacted. It was confirmed that there was a woman who did not speak English living alone as her husband had passed away. New York City Aging reached back. That's the new way that we're saying diff the councilwoman chin. <laughs> And uh, Council Member Machaca. Uh, New York, every time it confuses me too. Uh, New York City AG reached back to the senior center uh, who had a custodian deliver chef stable food to the older adults. That is the connection between the council member and that wonderful neighbor who identified this English speaking um, neighbor of theirs who was living in isolation and recently widowed. Um, she was thankful for the meals, but was afraid to leave her home because of COVID. She said she didn't need any, anything other than food. The program added the older adult to the meal delivery list, and she began to receive food through Get Food New York's emergency food delivery system. In addition to meals and case management, New York City's aging network of senior center also provides a wide range of education. Oh my God, I said that really weird. A wide range of educational and enrichment options. Some examples of these activities include nutrition education, creative writing classes, intergenerational program, assistance with employment benefits and housing supports. Now all of those programs are done virtually or telephonically. Many of these program offers are rooted in other cultures. For example, salsa classes, African drumming, Chinese art, Tai Chi, yoga. They've all become staples at many centers. Many of these programs are being offered in languages other than English. And if you go to, there's a program, Amico in Brooklyn, that is, I call it the United Nations. They have uh, Asian, Latino, uh, East, uh, East Asians, Indians, Russians, and Italians, all cohabiting in these three floors, dancing, and it is quite a sight to see. So I invite everyone to go to Amico at least once. It is, it's a treat. Um, and there are specific offerings in a variety of centers, you know, and uh, the goal is to do more and more Amicos because as the population changes, they will no longer be a one program that can address one population. There'll be multiple populations in a particular, in a particular center. We also understand that many seniors are now living in naturally occurring retirement communities, commonly known NORCs across the city. Our goal is obviously to increase those NORCs over time. New York City Aging Fund Services for 28 NORCs. And there are additional 32 NORCs that are funded directly by the state or discretionary, or discretionary funding by, by New York City Council members. So we thank you for that. On average, just under 49% of older adults were born in another country. However, out of the New York, aging, New York, New York City aging funded programs, 52% of them are in communities where the percentage of foreign born older adults exceeds that of the city average. So our NORCs and the, fund, the ones funded by the Department of the Aging are in multicultural communities uh, um, and immigrant communities, which we're very proud of. Uh, of those that are funded by the state or discretionary funds, 63% of those NORCs are also in districts that have a higher than average concentration of immigrant older adults. These supports, the earlier mentioned data shows there is a trend for immigrants aging in place. And so that is something that we're looking to in the future to make sure that we can program, uh, which is one day, soon I will be talking to Chairwoman Chin about something called community cares, which is to address the needs of people who are aging in place. Many of our immigrant older adults are caregivers or have caregiving. And we, I know that personally, and I know some of you also know that personally. It is quite a task uh, to be a caregiver. Zoraya and her husband are among them. Zoraya has a, uh, acts as a secondary caregiver to her husband who's suffering from cancer and diabetes. And then uh, she and her husband entered the country in 2013. 
uh, 17 from the Dominican Republic and have since succeeded their time allowed on this on a visa on a, per, a visitor's visa access to paying jobs is challenging due to the immigration status and medical needs so they really suffer from a lot of financial instability which is not uncommon in addition to caring for her husband Zariah assists with child care in exchange for room and board uh, for the living room in which they both live Zariah was able to contact PSS Circle of Care Caregivers, which is one of our caregiving programs uh, funded by the New York City Department for the Aging, New York City Aging, through which supported services are provided to caregivers. Through this program, the family is able to receive, was able to receive an air conditioner, medication, medical supplies, metro cards, and a new mattress. Additionally, they've been provided with resources for immigration, support counseling, and individual respite care. So Daya now has the time to have some respite for herself from all of from her from her daily caregiving. And uh, this is one of this in Zoraya's words, these are her words. The assistance we've received has had a very positive impact. This program has been a helping hand during these difficult times. Due to our legal status, we are limited in the amount of help we can get. Every time we have a need, circle of care has been there. They provided an air conditioner, saved our lives during time of extreme heat. Incontinence supplies have been a great relief for me and, and for my financial burden. I could go on and on about the number of things that they've helped us with, but all the services have been of great value. Thank you. There are also unknown numbers of unrecognized caregivers. We know that. Most caregivers do not even consider themselves caregivers in an immigrant family. They feel that it is their responsibility. Um, and for a variety of reasons, they understand that the role they're playing is just the norm in our culture. And so New York City Aging continues to educate our providers and clients how to encourage uh, caregivers to identify themselves as such. With such an understanding, caregivers are then able to find the supports they need and to help them navigate through this very complex process of benefits. And they also are able to give you some respite care. Every caregiver needs one day to just take time for themselves. Eight New York City aging partners with community-based organizations help provide on the ground support services. So another example is the Hamilton Madison House uh, Hamilton Madison House Citywide Caregiver Program is one of those such partners. They serve caregivers and older adults who speak Chinese, Korean, Japanese. Olivia Han, uh, director of Hamilton Madison House Citywide Caregiver Program says for many immigrants, whether undocumented or not, we're able to be the safety net. We have been able to connect many of our clients with vouchers through the New York City's Office of Immigration Affairs in emergency relief funding and some funding in emergency response grants due to life circumstances. We also help immigrants clients find other community-based organizations to join and help support networks as well as social networks. This allows them to find a place to potentially exchange and engage in uh, organizing and advocacy within the community beyond themselves. So in conclusion, I'm saying that these are just a few examples of how New York City Aging, in partnership with our providers and sister agencies such as Moya, connect with immigrant older adults to services that they need. New York City Aging is pleased to be able to provide culturally competent services. Can we do better? Should we be doing more? Absolutely. Um, but we are doing, given the resources and the limitations that we have, we are doing everything possible and making sure that we provide the cultural competency training so that we can expand those services. I am incredibly grateful to Chairman Chin and the entire aging committee for your continued advocacy and partnership and support for this community, for these immigrant communities and for older New Yorkers as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. I'm now gonna turn it over to questions from Chairman Chaka, followed by Chair Chin. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during the question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Chaka, please begin. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Ravani, and thank you, Commissioner, for uh, for being here and and for sharing the stories. I think it was really important for us to remember what it felt like when centers were senior centers were open, when we were in full throttle in the experiences. Uh, I I I remember just going in and dancing and singing and just being in community and how much I want to go back. To that, that to that space, uh, and and I think this just makes this hearing even more important because all of that is gone, in so many ways. All of that uh, important infrastructure is is what we're talking about here in services, and I think those are beginning to shift and change. Um, I also just want to note that uh, we are not joined by the commissioner of Moya, and I'm always disappointed when I cannot have the commissioner here before the city council's committee on immigration. Um, we're really excited that Nick is here and I have questions for him and I hope that he can answer the questions that we have. And if not, um, we will ask you to get someone on the line uh, to be able to answer them because this is really critical as we prepare for the budget and for other legislative agenda items. And so um, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, I'm gonna actually hand it over to Chair Chin so that she can ask you uh, as the uh, appropriate agency since you did testify and I'll come back with my Moya questions. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you so much. I hope to dance soon at a senior center. <laughs> we all hope. <laughs> I think we all hope to do that. We're all hoping for that. Get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got to make sure all our seniors get vaccinated. And that's what we told the mayor and the vaccine command center. Open up our senior centers. Do the vaccination there, right? Do it at our 202 buildings. Do it at our north. The infrastructure is there. I know we don't have enough vaccine, but let's get ready. When the vaccine comes, we are ready. So we want to work with you to make sure that it's easy for our seniors to get it. Because right now it's so difficult. It's ridiculous. You get on the website, you can't, you, you, you can't navigate. You get on the phone, it takes hours. And that's the complaint that we've been getting uh, from our seniors, that they're so frustrated. And we just heard that the state is gonna give some, you know, to different community. And it's like, we all need it, especially for our uh, senior. Uh, Commissioner, it's always great to see you. Thank you. <laughs> You're looking well, so we uh, we got a lot of work to do. I mean, yep. in your testimony, you talk about you know the growing number of seniors, but then when you compare the budget, right? Seniors are over twenty percent of the city. Twenty-one percent will soon be almost twenty-five percent. Okay, and, and how much is the uh, the diff of budget? It's still less than half a percent, okay? And that's a shame. And that's why we need to continue to fight for more funding. We didn't get the 10 million that was promised uh, to support our senior center in the last budget. So we're gonna have to make sure we get that money and more. I mean, the senior center that you gave examples to, they're great and we need more of those. Um, and especially for our immigrant population. I know that there are 10 uh, senior centers that are serving immigrant population that are funded by city council discretionary yeah. funding. So my first question is, how is DIFTA working with these centers uh, before the pandemic and, and during the pandemic? And how do you see really incorporating them um, into DIFTA's portfolio, so they are contract the center. I know that this is a new RFP um, that you're working on. And so how do you sort of make sure so that they have a chance we, uh, to when, become a fund the senior center? I, if you recall, when I first became commissioner, two minutes after I became commissioner, maybe, maybe two days, I had a hearing. And I had to present, and it was one of the first things that you and Commissioner uh, and Council Member Danny Drum drilled me about <laughs> was about the the investment that the council made in um, in the immigrant uh, senior centers. And so, 
And my commitment at that time was to make sure that they were grown and received services and had capacity building training. And we've been doing all of that. And as we move, and it, most of that in preparation for this RFP that we will be releasing um, to make sure that they can compete. And we've also identified areas, um, as you know, we've been doing some mapping of older adults throughout New York and looking at where we have service deserts. And it's interesting, well, it's not interesting, it's not surprising that a lot of the service deserts are where there are some immigrant communities. And so that we do have the opportunity uh, for growth in those communities. And, but our commitment to make sure that those were not seen as separate and apart, but an integral part of the eight uh, NYC aging uh, was important to me, but it was also important to you. And uh, we made sure that we did that. So during the pandemic, uh, were you in contact with them to make sure that they are also, you know, calling um, the, the seniors and also providing they're, they're, they're the considered They're considered part of the portfolio. They're not, they are not distinct from, you know, we don't see federal funding, state funding, city council funding. We see aging service providers. And so they are, they are, they are incorporated into all of the uh, initiatives that New York City aging has. And if there is not, then I need you to let me know who has not, but I doubt it very seriously. I think it's the same issue with uh, some of the, the North program that is funded by discretionary uh, money from the city council because even in the last uh, budget we started some new norks um, yes. uh, right. in Staten Island and in, in right. uh, Walkaway. And, and, and although we don't have budget oversight when it comes to program and services we do and we're also very grateful to your support for all the norks uh, to receive the nursing services and so you know that that has continued. So we will, yeah, definitely we will uh, continue to do that during the, the budget time. Um, and you were talking about um, all the program that's doing by phone calls and by virtual. Um, not all seniors are tech savvy. <laughs> I know, so we know. How, so how is Tifta they're working with, you know, getting equipment? So Some of the seniors don't have the equipment and, uh, no, and they need no. training. Yeah, so 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 the the good thing is that we have we had the NYCHA program, you know, that despite some of the it was a, a success where ten thousand older adults were able to get um, ten thousand older adults were able to get tablets in all of the NYCHA programs, and uh, that in addition to the twenty two programs that we support to get technology training through OATS, you know, so that just augmented that program, uh, those services. What we've done as a result of that is uh, start working with the CTO, the uh, city's technology, uh, chief technology officer, to make sure that we can try to replicate the NYCHA program. And what we're looking to do is to do just that, you know, create an infrastructure so that more and more people can have the tablets and, uh, and the training, the companion training with those tablets, because what good is a tablet if you don't know how to fully utilize mm -hmm. it? So to have the companion training. And for us, it has been, you know, we will look at it as we, as we roll out new initiatives, you know, and uh, together we will make sure that those kind of things are possible. Um, but that is the way of the future. And we know that that's the direction that we have to go into. And we, yeah, you know, it has been amazing. When we started this pandemic, there were only 31 programs, Councilwoman Chin, who did virtual programming. Right now we have upwards of 200 and they are doing very creative things. And what we've done now is create a library so that they could use each other's programs and services or brings you quite, you know, state of the art kind of programming at the local senior center. So um, lots, lots to do and uh, not enough time to do it. <laughs> not just enough time, not enough money. <laughs> so uh, we got to make yes. sure we got our fair share, especially <laughs> um, 
And we got to make that loud and clear to the administration that the senior population cannot be ignored. And the immigrant population cannot be ignored. I think in this budget, we're hopeful that there will be more support from the federal government. And Commissioner, we behind you. And I'm really happy to hear that there'll be some good news coming in a week or so about our senior centers. And yes. so we're, we, uh, we're very- about, about them getting involved hopeful. in the food security. And we don't lose, you know, and, and as you know, you know, from the very beginning, we've been working very closely with the Vaccine Command Center. Um, we established this work group. You heard about the work group, um, mm -hmm. um, I think that the last hearing. You know, if we meet with them regularly, weekly, to make sure that we get real time feedback on what what improvements are necessary, and uh, and our colleagues at the Vaccine Command Center have been very responsive, and um, and making making things accessible. And we are very, you know, we've ne it's never off the table that senior centers could be a uh, a site. It's just how is it that we meet the demands of of the vaccine as well as all of the conditions that are required for that. So it, nothing's off the table. It is still all part of the process. And, um, and I must say the Vaccine Command Center is really being responsive to, um, to the needs of older adults as, and I'm sure that Nick will also amplify that to the language access and all of the issues for immigrant, immigrant communities also. Yeah, I mean, like we we talk to the staff at the Vaccine Command Center and we keep saying the same thing over and over again. Infrastructure are there. And I know that in our last hearing, they did talk about that they did surveys of the senior center that uh, 100s are possible. Um, so we say, well, where are they? We just wanna make, oh, make sure oh, that oh, it's oh, well. easy for our center. I was yeah, saying no, but but we've made some good movement in that arena. We have the NYCHA senior centers that are also serving as vaccine pods, which is a great, a great uh, movement forward. We also have, you know, JASA has uh, been selected to be, a, you know, through the state, JASA, mm -hmm. some of the, the housing projects, as well as another JASA program. Uh, has served as a pod. So, so we have models that we can build on and use as examples. Rain just this weekend, you know, was able to serve as a pod just for a weekend as a test. Um, and they were able to do 270 vaccines. So um, we are, you know, there are, there are examples and we're moving forward and, you know, we'll see where the demand is. And we're also very fortunate with Yankee Stadium for the Bronx, that is, you know. Um, so I know as a, we're, we're, I, as a Bronx side, I had to throw that one in and as a Yankee fan. <laughs> I know that. I mean, that's why the, there are examples out there. I mean, the, the, the issue is making sure that we get the vaccine and also better coordination yeah. with the state. So it's like, I, yeah. sometimes it's so confusing. The state is saying something or the state is doing something and the city is, so I think we really need better coordination with the mayor um, and the governor. When we, when we, I, I want to just put things in perspective also. When we were rolling out the plan for the vaccine, we were rolling out a plan for 75 plus. And so with the Vaccine Command Center and the entire city, we were looking at a population of about 300,000, all right? Uh, a little bit over 300, 350,000 more, 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 more or less. And then, you know, within hours, it went to 65. Not, I don't think it was hours. I think it was a hour. And so then that meant that the demand was over a million people. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, if you're planning for a third of the population and now you have, you're planning for the whole, it, it will tax um, systems. In addition to taxing the systems, you know, we have this supply demand uh, competition. You know, we demand it there. People are more and more interested as we do more education, fear gets dissipated. But yet, you know, we have a supply issue. And, and so that's why I keep saying, I wish it were better, it could be better, but, but it is a, a demand issue. And yeah. I want us to be persistent so that we can get vaccinated. 
you know. Yeah, no, we we agree with you. We know that it is a demand issue and we don't have enough supply. But right. the, the thing is that we want to make sure that there is a plan in place, there's a infrastructure in place. So when we do get the supply that we're ready to roll it out as quickly as possible. And that's what the coordination of, you know, working with DIFTA, Moya, making sure. sure that our immigrant population, our immigrant seniors um, are protected, that they know, because they're the one that's having the most difficulty. I mean, our office has oh. been creating calls. Like, they, they don't speak either. They can't get on the website. They can't get an appointment. Uh, so that's why we need to have um, these programs, these pods in immigrant communities that makes it easier for them to be able um, to access. So I guess the other thing that I wanted to, to talk with you about is the coordination and, and work with other agencies. I mean, we have a lot of immigrant older workers um, who are getting you know, exploited and they're having problem. And then we have the Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection. Um, are, is Moya and, and DIFTA working with them? Are there any um, communication between the agency to make sure that resources are available to older immigrant workers? We we are we are working very closely with the respective par, uh, parties, particularly around exploit uh, exploit uh, ex being exploited individuals. So that is a key issue for us. An older worker and financial security of all older New Yorkers is, is key to us. Uh, and I will. Um, so we work very very closely with the authorities to deal with the with the exploiting issue. Uh, and I can uh, have Nick uh, address some of the things in particular that we may be doing jointly, but uh, the Moya works very closely with the network of agencies, um, with all of the senior center agencies um, to -hmm. make sure that they get all of the information um, about immigration and all of the supports. So Nick, um, I will turn that over to you if you wanna add anything. Nick? Are you on mute? Wonderful. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Chin and Chairman Taka. And I just want to say um, uh, for us at Moya, immigrant seniors are an extremely important population, both personally as immigrants and the children of immigrants, as many of us are, but also as the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, just yesterday, to be directly responsive to your question, Chair Chin, uh, we were in touch with the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, particularly about uh, uh, wage theft and uh, exploitation, um, and making sure undocumented workers or undocumented seniors also have a way to 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 be reached through this effort. So, it's something we're in daily communication with with the Vaccine Command Center, with our colleagues at the Department mm -hmm. of Health. Uh, we uh, are coordinating across agencies to bring resources and expertise to reach these populations. Um, we're also advising a lot on the outreach materials, languages. We're making sure that uh, virtual uh, uh, outreach also has a phone component for, for populations who don't have internet. Uh, we're gonna be standing up and have a number of them scheduled vaccine information town halls with multiple agencies coming together, partnering with community-based organizations, many of them DIFTA providers uh, to, to reach populations like the ones we're discussing now. Yeah, and Chairwoman Chin, just yesterday, um, we met with uh, a professor at NYU, uh, Dr. G uh, Ernst Gonzalez, to really look at our senior employment program to help us come up with an intake process and processes that are more inclusive and, um, not, and are not pro barriers uh, to employment. Um, and also to look at new, new employer populations that we should be working with. So there is this constant re rethinking and re-looking at all of our services. And this is the first time, and I would say maybe in, I started at the Department for the Aging and the Employment Unit. And uh, I think this is the first time that we're saying it's time for a refresh. And so we're really pleased with this partnership with NYU uh, to do just that. Great. And I think lastly, before I, I turn it back to um, Chairman Chaka, is that um, does DIFTA have 
um, I guess working with you know the 202 buildings and uh, and the uh, North building. I know in one of the um, other hearing that we have when we're talking about you know getting technology to uh, you know to the seniors. Do you have data in terms of like some of the the senior buildings and the North yes. building, what, the immigrant population uh, in yes. there? And the other thing is that are you working uh, to really look at how to get the whole building uh, connected to the internet? So it's not individual senior, but the whole building. Because uh, we have example from one of the senior provider that she was able to get a um, very reasonable price for the whole building. So now the whole building is connected. Um, so the senior yes. will have the opportunity to use the, you know, to, to participate in these virtual programs. Well, um, the, 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 the big issue, and I think you're right, um, because I know some of the buildings when they were first developed had a dedicated company that wired the building. And so therefore the choice for older adults is limited. And so that's something that I think that we should be uh, addressing. But I think what the biggest issue for all of us as New Yorkers is broadband, accessible broadband and expanding that. Um, that ends up being one of the biggest barriers for every technology program that we may come up with and that you and I want and that everyone in this city wants is the cost of the, uh, the, the monthly cost of, the, of mm -hmm. the program. So it's one of the things that we're looking at with the um, chief technology officer. How can we mitigate that? How can we make some arrangements with some of the companies? Um, and those are, those are a variety of the things that we're looking at. But I, I get very concerned when a building was already wired with a particular company, which then means the senior doesn't have many options. But if we had universal broadband um, in many of our communities, which is one thing I think I want all of us to keep you know, persisting. Mm -hmm. I know that the administration is, is working on that. Um, that would help mitigate some of those concerns and that cost. Yeah, so we really look forward to working on that and uh, Commissioner, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we get the resources. And this yes. is the budget year that we gotta make sure that our immigrant seniors, our seniors are all taken care of. Uh, so I'm gonna- Absolutely. You, I, I can't thank you enough for that partnership. And this is also the time to put a little crack in status quo and start revisioning our centers of the future. So- uh, That's right. You. I thank you so much. No, we thank you for your partnership. So I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Chairman Chaka. Thank you so much, Chair Chen. And I, uh, I just concur with everything that was discussed in terms of the partnership and the, the budget and what it needs to do to reflect the needs of our communities, especially those impacted by COVID that are taking the brunt of so much of what we're experiencing and seeing firsthand with data. This isn't an anecdote. We know that this is real. And we have been joined as well by a few other council members. And I wanna say uh, thank you for joining us today for our joint hearing. Uh, council member Eugene Traeger Deutsch, thank you for, so much for being here today. And I will begin then with questions for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And Nick, thanks again for joining us today. Yeah, in Moya's annual report, there's a description of the older immigrant population disaggregated by immigration status. Does Moya have additional data on where older immigrant New Yorkers live within the five boroughs? Thank you for the question, council member. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I got you. Fantastic. Um, we, we definitely do have that data. Um, I will say uh, a lot of the data is is based off of by where languages are spoken. Um, so I'd be happy to circle back with uh, specifics from, uh, uh, from that. I will say that uh, we can get it to you right after this hearing. Okay, um, or, okay, <laughs> well, let's, let's go. Let's see how the rest uh, of the questions go. Does the Moya have country of origin data or top language uh, or languages spoken for this particular population? 
Absolutely. Um, so, so we know about 60% of our immigrant seniors don't speak English well, uh, are considered a limited English proficient. Um, we know, uh, for example, that uh, uh, a significant majority, about 40% of our immigrant seniors are from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, data uh, specific to um, both uh, their citizenship status, their, uh, and then so who isn't uh, as well, 20% who are not citizens of that population. Uh, poverty, English proficiency, um, the number, uh, sort of the, the top languages spoken as well. Okay, I guess, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm relating this to the first part of the question that really focuses on older immigrant populations that are disaggregated. And so really what I'm trying to find out is, and, and I know that we, you have the general, the general information, what we're looking for is country of origin data or top languages for the disaggregated seniors yeah, council member, it's 26% uh, we know are from, I can sort of give you the regions. We can say 26% okay. we, we look at from Europe, uh, well, 46%, I'm gonna correct myself, uh, from Latin America and the Caribbean, and 23% from Asia and Oceania. Okay, and, and okay. Well, let's, well, let's go back to that because I, I, think, I think we also wanted a sense of the data that's connected to the locations in the five boroughs and so i'm not i'm not understanding how how your how the data is connected in terms of percentages for um for boroughs so let's come back to that uh what does moya have about uh what data does moya have that speaks to the unique needs of older immigrant new yorkers as distinct from the u.s born counterparts Sure, absolutely. So we know that about 50% of uh, senior immigrants are about 50% more likely to be living in poverty than our native born uh, senior, right? So uh, from our work, we know technology is going to be an issue in terms of access, right? We know the needs in terms of benefits is going to be stronger. We need, we know that the, our work is sort of critical from that data, we know that uh, we're, our outreach has to be targeted towards our immigrant communities, towards those hardest to reach those who are least likely to you know, access benefits. And that's what we do every single day. Our team is on the ground providing services in communities, uh, getting the word out about our programs and services. Um, throughout the pandemic, I'll just say, uh, we started uh, like many of our sister agencies doing virtual outreach in March and April. Uh, we continue that to this day. We've done about 360 in language know your rights presentations since the pandemic started. Right. As I mentioned, uh, Nick, if I could stop you there, uh, what I'm looking for is very specifically the older immigrant population. Uh, that's what the hearing is trying to focus on, and so I, I still feel like this is a general. This is a general uh, release of information, and that's that's what I'm looking for. Council member Menchaca, I can give you, and it's, uh, Nick, I, I will support you in this also. We can give you immigrant, uh, older adult immigrant population, and we can disaggregate it by borough for you. So I will uh, see what we have and give you that. I, um, and I'm not sure if we could give you every uh, country of origin, but I'll see what data we do have. All right. And so we can support you with that information. Wonderful. And, and so back to the, the third question, which is really trying to think about um, the programs associated with the focus on the elder immigrant population. Are there any programs that are designed specifically, uh, and this is, this is towards Moya, to really yeah. focus um, their resources? I think we heard a lot back and forth about how the council is supporting um, the Department for the Aging. And what I'm asking Moya is, what about that data that, that you can pull out, that you're gonna pull out and ask and let us have are connected to programs for that population? Sure. Absolutely. I just wanna say from a, 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 it's a great question. And, and so from a starting point, I think it's really important to, to sort of convey that all of our programs, we, we serve all immigrant New Yorkers, right? Regardless of their age. And when it comes to the outreach for those programs and sort of the method, that's where we specialize specifically in, in practices um, and in tactics that will reach those populations, right? So for example, our We Speak NYC program, after the, uh, you know, uh, 
after the pandemic began, we quickly transitioned it to a virtual. Uh, we have classes in uh, um, uh, virtually. Um, there was a drop. There was a drop in older adults using the, uh, you know, uh, because of the di digital divide. Uh, what we did on an you have outreach a front. Nick, of how much there was a drop for the elders. Again, all my questions are going to focus, and so I'm hoping that you can you can tailor the the yeah. answers to how older. This is this is part of the problem that we're we're facing right now in the city, is that elder immigrant New Yorkers get pushed into a space with everybody else, and what what this hearing is trying to do is really pull that population out, study it with data. Uh, we're hoping that you could come with some data today and, and really look at programs that, that, that do this work. Uh, and, and it just, it requires a different approach. Uh, you just heard from, from Chair Chin talk a lot about, about very specific ways and tools that the council has been trying to do with budget to, to infuse these data, this, this, um, the programs that respond to data. So can you tell us a little bit about what the decrease was for the program you just mentioned of elder New York immigrants? Sure, absolutely. So um, we, and, and I can get you any more specifics after this hearing as well, but what I can tell you today is that uh, we saw an initial drop uh, from uh, usage across every single demographic. We, we surveyed the students, uh, the English language learners and leaders to understand sort of what languages they speak and sort of demographic information. Um, there was an initial decrease. It has slowly climbed back up. Um, I would say uh, we have seen in sort of cycle one, which was started in April, uh, we saw um, uh, uh, we were down significantly. Um, I'm pulling up that data for you now. Excuse me, it's uh, my notes here. Pardon me. Um, Right now we're about uh, 2,500 uh, and that is up, that is students across the four cycles of We Speak. Uh, we started in April at a decrease and that number was, let's say we were at, Councilor, I'm gonna circle back to you in just a moment as I pull that up, but okay. I'm happy to and, start. And again, question. we're looking for a separation of older immigrant New Yorkers that have been impacted uh, by We Speak and numbers. And so that's, that's, that's what's gonna be necessary for this hearing to be successful. Um, let's go to the next question. The Center for Urban Future has been tracking the population growth of older adults in New York and noted specific growth in older immigrant adult populations in New York City. And I think both um, Chair Chin and I spoke to that in our openings. How is Moya tracking this population growth, its geography and matching city service to meet their growth? This is a little bit more general, but what we're looking for is a real understanding of how, as the data is shifting and changing, how Moya is, is shifting its resources, not just we speak, but I'm thinking about legal services. I'm thinking about a whole bunch of things that Moya does uh, through Action NYC, et cetera. Absolutely. I'll say that um, we're, we're definitely conscious of the trends, right? Uh, our, our data team is, uh, is uh, uh, through our annual report and also through our work with advocates, we know certainly uh, what the trends are. Um, I think the, the biggest changes that we'll see uh, from our work is in a greater acknowledgement of in terms of the outreach, for example, when we have RFPs, uh, t targeting organizations and communities who previously haven't been reached and making sure that we don't have gaps in those services. Services. Um, in addition to that, I'd say, you know, as we know, those who've been most disconnected from services throughout this pandemic, that's where we've really had to go as deep as possible. So whether that was in testing example. outreach on the street, in person, sure, yeah, absolutely. Give an example so, of what that might look sure. like. Sure, absolutely. So, so 
as you know, we do we do lots of in person outreach. Really, starting from June, we've we've moved uh, to continue our virtual work to, because it's so uh, helpful and successful for for folks who need it. But also at food pantries where we see many seniors lined up. Um, I can say La Jornada in Queens, even at Good Shepherd in Brooklyn. We we've been at those locations handing out information about our programs and services. Right, we know who the most vulnerable New Yorkers are. Right, and we that's that's who we're targeting our outreach for every single day. Also, just want to return to the previous point about how we try to customize like, you know, all of our virtual events and all of our in-person engagements to make sure we have language capacity on site. We have ac options to access those resources for folks who don't have internet access, for example, over the phone. So in everything that we do to reach out for our programs, this could be, you know, putting information out on WeChat, uh, handing it out in person and sending it to ethnic press to let folks know that there's a talent hall coming up, right? This could be um, standing at a food pantry line, advertising that town hall as well to make sure it doesn't just get to folks over email or um, uh, through the internet or, or through social media. We also know many communities and many immigrant seniors who may have greater access to sort of messenger apps such as WeChat and WhatsApp and Kakao Talk than their native born uh, uh, sort of partners in New York City. So, so we, we've utilized all of those platforms and tactics to reach immigrant seniors. And it's, it's work that continues every single day. And I'd say this is for all, each of our programs. I'd also point out to our, for you mentioned specifically for Action NYC, many of our uh, partners, many of our contracted per partners are doing in-person outreach for Action NYC in person still. Often that's connected to their sort of provision of services that have been on the front lines of this pandemic. So in their outreach around food pantries, um, providing food to communities, we've seen them also bring in clients for these programs as well. And they're truly the experts, you know, in how to um, make sure that they're, they're reaching the community members that they serve. Okay, uh, I and again, I, I appreciate the uh, the the kind of general eff effort that's happening. We, we're going to need that data to really get a sense about what's happening um, because I think there's a, there's a lot of problems with language access right now that I think the city is not meeting uh, its own law <laughs> that we passed to language access, and so uh, this is this is. Uh, it's just hard for me to understand without without data and information. So I'm hoping that you can follow up as soon as possible, so we can make a better sense of how we how we move forward with recommendations on policy. Uh, let's move on to the next question. What guidance does Moya give uh, DIFTA regarding providing services and conducting outreach to older immigrant populations? I think you've laid out a really great review of what you're doing, but how we're looking at the relationship and collaboration with. Um, with Commissioner Cortez Vasquez and their team. And so can you walk us through what Moya does? How does it do it? Sure, absolutely. So it's a great question. And uh, the commissioner and I uh, are in touch. I know our leadership speaks regularly um, with and our senior team at Moya, which I'm a part of, and uh, uh, speaks regularly with DIFTA's senior team as well. Uh, I will say that uh, we work primarily with DIFTA's providers, both on outreach um, and uh, and to provide direct services like immigration legal services. So we're constantly in touch in that way. We've also scheduled many presentations where staff can share resources and guidance, for example, uh, with their hotline. Uh, and when I say DIFTA, I, I'm gonna return to uh, NYC Aging um, uh, uh, to, I, to be clear. So NYC Aging, it's still, uh, it's still hard for me. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, we've, we've connected with uh, NYC Aging's uh, Senior Connect um, you know, we'll share information, for example, about the FASTEN program and other programs that are available to New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. Um, we'll work together, um, uh, you know, for example, when we're putting together graphics and, and content to be able to share with immigrant seniors, we'll consult DIFTA. So we're, we're frequently in touch as a senior. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and on that point, I just, I, we, I want specifics here. Uh, and so what, what have you collaborated for older immigrant adults in New York City? Very specific. I want a program, yeah. uh, an example of a collaboration that has sprouted from your communication with so NYC. We've def mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, with NYC, uh, with, with, with NYC, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So we've We're been in touch to share it. resources. We've been in touch to, to share resources uh, with NYC Aging. 
uh, specifically around Senior Connect, some of the programs that we're uh, um, trying to get the word out to immigrant New Yorkers about. So when folks call in their hotline, they're also sort of in touch with uh, us as well. When there are questions, for example, that we can, where we can offer technical assistance or advice, our interagency team, uh, which is, uh, has language access under its portfolio, has also been in touch with DIFTA throughout the pandemic. I know our comms teams are frequently in touch in terms of uh, making sure our messaging is, is uh, consistent and that we're including uh, resources that DIFTA offers in our MOYA messaging that we get out through Know Your Rights forums, through uh, sharing, uh, say, graphics over WeChat and WhatsApp or talking about them on virtual and telephonic town halls. So we're we're frequently in touch as a sister agency. I will I will definitely um, you know just to be clearer, we also I would say a bulk of our work really is with providers that DIFTA uh, uh, works with. So we're we'll be in touch uh, with senior centers with with programs to make sure that they're getting the information from us at that end as well. So when there's a virtual town hall that we partner in or a telephonic town hall for the community at that senior center in language that we're, we're coordinating to make sure that they're receiving information about services available regardless of immigration status. Um, and so those are all specifics in terms of outreach activations. I will definitely say, you know, personally, if, if, if you're looking for a sort of a micro example, I'd say I've worked with DIFTA in, in sharing resources about our uh, sort of work for tenants, uh, immigrant tenants um, who are undocumented through the FASN program and sharing those out. We've also collaborated directly on graphics and other things that are specifically for seniors uh, and that uh, we work through our outreach teams to, to get out to seniors. What type of calls or requests does Moya receive uh, specifically from older immigrant New Yorkers uh, through their hot, through your hotline and information desks? Thank you. It's it's a great it's a great question. So um, our Ask Moya hotline two one two seven eight eight seven six five four receives calls every single day from immigrant New Yorkers. Um, we are uh, frequently connecting individuals. For example, throughout the pandemic, we had about fifty nine enrollments. Uh, specifically on that hotline um, for uh, the Get Cool program, uh, access uh, questions for, you know, about air conditioners. Um, we've got several, um, and I can get the exact number uh, for screen, uh, screen enrollment. Uh, we've gotten many questions individually for, you know, what are uh, the public charge and sort of uh, how can I access this benefit and that benefit. Um, uh, I'd say We've gotten it's the, the number is ten specific uh, for on on the get cool program and uh, scree uh, tax abatement. Uh, also, the other really big one that we've we've helped with and we've also proactively uh, tried to reach immigrant seniors who are not necessarily connected to the senior programs around the get food program. So our staff has all been trained as authorized enrollers. Um, we have about twenty strong uh, team of community organizers at Moya who speak. 17 plus languages. Um, and so throughout this process, we've been trying to reach individuals who are not being reached at the point of you know, service delivery through senior centers and other places, um, specifically with the Get Food program. Our community service uh, uh, line got 59 of those requests and through our outreach and organizing efforts, we've refielded many more. Poverty rates are higher among older immigrant adults and compared, and that's compared to US born counterparts. How is Moya able to and working to address this specific uh, data point? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think as, as noted earlier, um, the most vulnerable in our, in our society and in amongst uh, the communities where we serve are often our immigrant seniors with limited English proficiency, and we know that. And so when it comes to our outreach, we are really fine tuning it to that point. Uh, to get the word out uh, to to seniors about programs, uh, poverty alleviation, uh, benefits access. Uh, we've made many uh, referrals throughout the pandemic, specifically on SNAP, uh, explaining eligibility for, for mixed status families uh, when they call our constituent service line, as well as through our outreach and organizing team and fielding questions from CBOs. Um, I'd also say that uh, NYC CARE and NYC CARE outreach in person started back in August. 
um, you know, where there are seniors who don't qualify for federal programs, that outreach has continued uh, to connect individuals to uh, to the city's healthcare access program, which is obviously, you know, and have been a major part of is, is uh, uh, available to all regardless of immigration status. So we've really tried to uh, make Nick, sure on the outreach front. Yeah, yeah and, and sorry, it looks like the commissioner. Home. What about senior housing vouchers? Uh, we know that they are historically not uh, accepted. And does Moya advocate to ensure that there's universal acceptance to these vouchers to ensure that housing access uh, happens to our vulnerable populations? Sure. I would just say on a number of, uh, if, if you don't mind, just to go through the different sort of housing pieces here, I'd say uh, we've been in touch to, to be directly responsive. Do we advocate? Absolutely. That is our role uh, within the mayor's office working with agencies. So we, we will frequently be in touch with HPD, um, with the mayor's public engagement unit and others to ensure that that, that outreach is, being, uh, is there, that the messaging is clear, that we're able to sort of aggregate a lot of that messaging and put it out there for communities in the languages that they speak uh, directly. Um, so we've been in touch with HPD uh, throughout the pandemic to talk about how, particularly for undocumented New Yorkers, but also especially and especially seniors, uh, can can access uh, you know housing connect in other areas. Trying to make sure that we're not you know sort of solely relying on on tech in order to solve these problems. Um, aside from that, um, a lot of the work that we have done really has been around making sure that people are, uh, who are eligible for resources from the city say it's a one-shot deal from HRA uh, or privately uh, through, through the FASN program are able to connect with those, um, those resources and, and get direct access in the languages that they speak. Let's talk about food security. Uh, and this is something that's plaguing so many New Yorkers right now. Uh, but when we're pulling out older immigrant New Yorkers, uh, we also know that cultural relevant food is important as well. And that continues to be a very specific problem that creates more issues in this pandemic. What's Moya done to prioritize this kind of food access, culturally responsive food to our community, immigrant communities? And what has DIFTA done to do that? Great question, absolutely. And I just wanna say that culturally competent food is you know, especially critical for seniors. We know this. This is an area where my team has worked directly uh, with the Get Food program. Uh, both, you know, when, when issues started uh, coming up in terms of the lack of cultural competency, we did a lot of intentional outreach to make sure that the RFPs got to uh, vendors who, who can serve immigrant communities culturally competent food. Um, uh, so we helped with that process. We also lifted up um, community concerns from CBOs and individuals that we speak on a day-to-day -day basis about quality. Vendors have been fired. The program has, has made incredible strides uh, and improved greatly. A lot of that's been because of a really close, you know, sort of lockstep uh, partnership with uh, the Get Food team and making sure that we've been able to advocate internally for culturally competent food. Um, a big part of that also, I would just say is, um, you know, reporting and making sure communities know that when there are issues, uh, there are ways to report them. Our staff takes these concerns extremely seriously. It's, it's something that we hear every day when we speak to communities. And so on the Moya front, we've, we've advocated internally with the Get Food team. We've been involved in the direct outreach uh, to, to make sure that the RFPs went out far and wide, but especially we're reaching uh, vendors who can supply culturally competent meals. Uh, we've lifted up community feedback to make sure that uh, where there were issues that they got dealt with. And, and you know, we're talking about food for our parents. You know, we take this extremely seriously. So this is an area that uh, that we, I know the city has made a lot of progress on and there's still a lot more to do. And I'll, I'll turn it over to the commissioner. I'm sorry, I was trying to jump in before, but I was muted. And um, what I, I wanna just underscore that there are on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, Chairman Manchaka, the Moya team works with our, you know, with the lion's share of our uh, network of agencies to ensure that they have and we have our latest information and have been working very closely with our Aging Connect hotline to make sure that we have the most accurate information as we're giving out. 
But you're absolutely right. The issues confronting the immigrant population are even more exacerbated in terms of the housing needs, the food insecurity. I would, I would ask that you, uh, for any of the uh, culturally competent food, I know that Get Food has made some great strides, but I would ask that any, any questions about number of contractors and number of food and the distinction in those foods uh, should be directed to Get Food. Um, it was something that we worked closely with them. In terms of the older adult, we also uh, given them a lot of guidance around the nutritional value of those foods and the kind of uh, requirements that we had given the number of food that they were providing on a weekly basis. So, I mean, it's something that we've worked closely, but I think that they are best positioned to address those questions directly. Commissioner, are you uh, measuring success or some kind of response as you move towards culturally responsive food to older immigrant New Yorkers? Is there a way that you're gauging a sense of we're doing a good job and people are getting the food that they want and need and getting the nutrition that they need? Is that something that you're measuring in any way specifically? Well, you know, for the the, we, we, we measure it in, in two ways, right? Okay. We measure it in terms of number of meals served versus population. And so if we start seeing gaps, we, we redress, all right? So that's one way that we, we assess. I, know I wouldn't call it a true measurement, but it's an assessment that we do. Another, another, another assessment that we do is we look for geographic um, service deserts. And all right, and how is it that we can then meet the demands of, of that? And we do that for all older New Yorkers. In particular, I'm, we are looking at that uh, in communities of color, because that's where we see some of the biggest gaps, right? And the other, um, the other way that we're measuring for the first time, and we think that we can reveal it soon, we'll unroll it. We started uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, a work group that was customer satisfaction. Because as you know, we all had, all, all senior centers, had a suggestion box and we used to laugh and well first you had to find the key to the suggestion box to see what the suggestions were <laughs> and so what we what we've been uh together with a lot of our network uh providers is started thinking about how is it that we can be like the hotel industry like the hospitality industry to get some real-time feedback from our um from our customers, you know, this time being the older adults and make sure that that is in, in language. And so it's one of the work groups that we have and hopefully we will have a actual system that we could in, um, put in place. Uh, it's, one of, it's, one of, it's one of the legacy projects that I'm hoping we will see um, in the near future. Well, that, that, sounds, that sounds really great. And, and just curious about the, disaggregating of data for older immigrant New Yorkers? Is that part of the, the way that you're designing this? You know this what, I, we didn't think of that. I thought of by ethnicity, culture, and language, um, but I, we could disaggregate it differently. No, we had not, but thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. Um, and this is, this is the power of this hearing in a lot of ways to really ensure that uh, some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers are not kind of lumped into a lot of these data points that, that I think we're, we're just seeing over and over again. So thank you so much for, for that partnership on that you know front. What? And I think, I think that is an important part of this. Um, and although we've gotten aggregate immigration data, I will go back to the team and start seeing how can we, in our own star system, can we put in immigration status? Uh, no, not, not, I don't want to not do that. Status. Not, not status. <laughs> Immigration, it's some kind of an indicator for immigration. All right, yeah. no status, language. we don't do status. Trust me, I'm an anti-status yeah, person. Language. Other than my own status. Of origin. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of different ways. And, and so we, this is where we want to really work with you all to- So we welcome your, your, we welcome your input, all right? On, uh, but but it, it's a data point that we may look at that we don't currently co collect. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. And I know I have seen a hand uh, from Councilmember Ayala, uh, and I'm gonna take a break from my questions so that I can give her the opportunity before she may have to leave. 
Time starts now. Can you unmute me? Oh, thank you. There you go. So I just, I'll have a, one of the things, and I'm sorry I missed it because I've been a little bit kind of preoccupied throughout the, the hearing, but, and I'm sorry because my computer's horrible, so the sound may not be the best quality, but um, one of the one of the concerns that I've had in the last you know uh, few years is really seeing the number of older adults uh, who are undocumented, don't qualify for Medicaid, don't qualify for Medicare, um, and who are living at home with adult children who now have to work and are forced to leave parents at home that are suffering from the, you know the advanced dementia. And I, I haven't been able to identify a single program that specifically addresses that. And you know, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue in, in the immigrant community as parents continue to age, right? And are more and more dependent on family. If that family is not available, then you know, it becomes a problem. And so I wonder, you know, I mean, you can't even, you don't even qualify for, for uh, you know, to live in an assisted living facility because, you, you know, those require, you know, some sort of medical insurance as well. So is there like an adult daycare program, a model that, you know, maybe um, already exists or is this a conversation that is being had? Um, because we're seeing, you know, this population continue to grow. And I don't know that we're ready to really help address. Wow. Um, that, no, I'm done. Okay. Great to see you. Um, I have to tell you that I did not ask you to ask that question. Right? So uh, one of the things that we are looking at really very closely and will be revealing hopefully in the very near future once we get uh, some, um, some questions answered um, is looking at this whole concept of community living, right? And community care um, and the benefit that it would be for the department to look at that is because we do not have income requirements for and nor do we have nor do we have status requirements for a lot of our services whether it's home care home delivered meals and so one of the things that we're looking at is how is it because right now we have a home care program you have a case management program you have a senior center and what is the connective tissue between those and we are working very closely with some of our providers and looking at, frankly, it came out of the thinking of the center of the future because some of the restrictions and some of the silos are self-imposed by funding source. And so what we're saying, let's take a leap. Let's start looking at ways that we can create connective tissue regardless of funding stream and come up with a continuum of care in the community because nursing homes are not the answer for everyone. Uh, and 90% of, of older New Yorkers want to live in their home and in their community. So why is it that we cannot structurally do that so that we can have a continuum of care so and build that into family caregiving because that person who's going to work is probably still has three quarters of her mind on the mother or the father that she's leaving at home and hopefully that they won't turn on the stove and all of the other concerns that come with caregiving. Um, so that is how we are looking right now at uh, a, a community of care, what I call universal aging in place, community care continuum, call it whatever you want. My thing is stay at home, have quality of life and dignity in your community in your language and surrounded by a system that supports you. And that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. So I promise you that, I promise everyone I did not ever ask that question. Thank you. No, that's wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. And if I can be helpful in any way. Um, yes, you can. And I'm gonna tell you right after this hearing, you and and and, and Chairwoman Chin, how you can be helpful <laughs> yeah, uh, right. about we're that happy. next step. We're All happy right. to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. I'm just going to quickly ask if any other council members have questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question of any of the panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and I will call on you in the order in which you've raised your hands. Seeing no other hands, I'm going to turn it back to Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arbani. And 
let's continue. Uh, this is, I believe this is gonna be strictly for, uh, for Moya, but commissioner don't hesitate to, to jump in. I'm looking for the percentage of the mayor's COVID-19 emergency relief fund and what was allocated specifically to older immigrant adults. Thank you, Council Member, and for the you question. Just let everyone know that you have fully disseminated those those, those dollars, and those dollars are in the hands of New Yorkers. Um, and then tell us a little bit about the older immigrant population. Yeah. So thank you, Council Member, for the question. So what I can tell you is that uh, we collect information, or we collected uh, information on the total number of people in each household who are 65 plus. Uh, that's what providers reported back to Moya and to the Open Society Foundation. Uh, the number was about 2,330 total number of seniors who sort of benefited either directly or as part of that uh, through the OSF funds. Uh, those funds certainly have been distributed um, and are no longer uh, uh, continuing. Um, so, you know, that, that's where that is now in terms of who was reached uh, from the senior population. And that, so that was, you said 200? Uh, 2,330 was the total number. Total number, 2,300 and change, and 200 of those were older immigrant adults. How many of, the, of them were older immigrant adults? 2,330 were older immigrant adults. And then what was the total amount of, 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 of New Yorkers served? The total number of New Yorkers served, um, uh, it is in my notes, give me one quick moment. Uh, it is in the uh, 76,000, and I'm looking for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the second part of that figure, but I know it's 76,000. I can confidently tell you that now. Okay, thank you for that. For older immigrant adults who continue to work outside the home throughout the pandemic, what resources has Moya provided uh, in their preferred languages? And we're looking for really the, the, uh, the work that Moya has done in specific in connection with DIFTA to ensure that individuals are aware of those rights uh, and when it specifically when it comes to labor issues. Mm -hmm. and, and I would also just say um, as, as part of an explanation for the, the number that you just asked for, I do want to just highlight that the, the underlining sort of thinking as part of that, that work through with the Open Society Foundation was really to reach workers. So worker centers were sort of a lot of times the main partners or other sort of institutions like that, uh, reaching folks who are undocumented workers who um, you know, are part of the informal economy. So, it, it, so frequently um, that number really went to, um, uh, you know, it's 2% of the adult uh, senior population is undocumented. Right? So when we think about that number, it's sort of in the larger ecosystem of, of the total demographics and who would be eligible and who was distributing uh, the, the funds. Uh, that said, there were many institutions such as settlement houses and others that were part of that, that effort. Um, to, to be specific and just responsive to your question about what programs and sort of how we've worked with DIFTA, I think it's, it's largely connected to our, our broader outreach strategy, uh, partnering with CBOs who run senior centers, uh, who run senior programs, um, as well as on the ground outreach as well. One resource that we uh, distribute in all of our sort of outreach engagements is our Moya One Pager, which is on our website. Currently, I believe it's in uh, 20 languages. We have efforts uh, underway to increase that and even include audio and other sort of resources to reach harder to reach communities who may have uh, lesser literacy rates and, and including indigenous languages and in addition languages of lesser diffusion. We're extremely uh, cognizant of, of the needs in that department when it comes to outreach. We were translating throughout the height of the pandemic um, in 25 languages for all of our outreach materials. And so I just really wanna highlight there's local law 30 um, but when it comes to outreach, we know that uh, the, the communities on the ground speak many more languages than the 10 that are required by local law. So we frequently uh, distributed information, held uh, info sessions, et cetera, in those additional languages. The FASTEN program is one that I want to keep highlighting is, uh, for, for undocumented New Yorkers. And certainly when we're at food pantries trying to approach folks who um, are seniors as well with these services is key to get that information in their hands physically. So it's not just a text message or uh, a, you know, a website post or on social media. Um, we've also, uh, through NYC Care Outreach, really tried to make sure that uh, we're supplementing the work done by CBOs and, and trying to get the word out in, in areas that are sort of were hardest hit by this pandemic. 
Um, I'd say for a number of our programs we speak, uh, we've, we've had a lot of work through that. I'd say the connection larger to the more broadly to city services has been sort of key for us. So even if it isn't a program that our teams directly administer, we have outreach for other city services. And you know, those will include uh, SNAP benefits, one-shot deals, uh, programs through our Human Resources Administration, uh, DSS HRA, um, and beyond. So, so we, we try to approach communities with a widespread of services. Sometimes these events will be done in parts so we're not overwhelming people. Our Know Your Rights presentations will cover the latest work with uh, sort of uh, federal and state programs that are available to New Yorkers regardless of immigration status. Um, so, so I, I hope that sort of answers the question and sort of describes the larger ecosystem and where, how we do outreach and sort of the, what we're approaching uh, New Yorkers with when we're on the ground. Uh, well, it, it, it does, but it, it, it's still, it's still a little bit broad and, and what, what, what I think is important to just respond to the earlier data about the 2000 plus New Yorkers that are, are in your data point that are connected to being an older immigrant New Yorker is, is that it's a really low percentage at the end of the day for, for the kind of relief that went, let alone the, the amount of relief that went to uh, immigrants that are not eligible for the federal programs. And so what I think what we, what I wanna say as chair of the immigration committee is that we also know that older immigrant New Yorkers are working uh, and so what we're trying to figure out is what the agencies are doing to support them with their rights. Many of them come to our district offices and they, they ask for support. When they've done that, they're in crisis many times. And so how do the agencies that touch uh, the immigrant populations in different ways through centers and, and all the programs that we've talked about today, how are you all supporting a very specific issue that's about labor? Uh, and yeah. Maybe I can ask a different question about PPE and ensuring that uh, workspaces that may not be providing PPE are endangering these older immigrant New Yorkers. And so is DIFTA or Moya doing anything to ensure that they have the protections they need when they go to work because they are working. Older immigrant New Yorkers are working in the city of New York. I'll More pass this one. We, we know. Yeah, I'll pass this one to DIFTA. I'll just say that we work very closely at Moya with our colleagues at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Their outreach team similarly is on the ground every day, and, and we work very closely to them with uh, outreach to employers. Um, that's been a key one for us. Um, and and we'll, we'll frequently partner with them to carry their outreach materials uh, to communities directly. Um, I'd say uh, Moya and the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, I, there's, there's probably no better metaphor than sister agency, but we, we work really lockstep when it comes to outreach um, and are very conscious of, of the senior population. I, I will just say, when, when we talk about 2%, particularly of undocumented seniors, um, you know, the experience that we, that we all have in senior centers and when people come up to us at events or on food pantry lines is that that number feels you know, maybe misleading. Um, I think the real stories and the real interactions with those seniors who we build trust with through our outreach and through our organizing is, is really um, tells the larger story. So we, we do a lot of that direct outreach with our sister agencies um, uh, to, to those workers, but it's, it's absolutely, it's something I think uh, is sort of not the directly within our wheelhouse and I'll pass it to the commissioner for, uh, for anything additional. Sure, thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, we have, over the course of the nine months, been delivering PPE to senior centers throughout the network um, at incredible clips, millions and millions of pieces of equipment, sanitizers, face masks, and things of that nature to all of our network providers um, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, and, um, and in that, the, every site has gotten multiple uh, versions uh, of whatever product we were giving at a particular time. But I can say that the struggle for PPEs that, that were at the beginning have been dissipated because we have had the opportunity to 
to keep our programs well supplied. And, uh, and many of them are, have, you know, materials that were not used because senior centers were then closed. So I know that they've made every effort to distribute those within their communities as, as widely as possible. Okay, I, I again, I, I'm, I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a gap in understanding here. It, it's, and I, I'm going to keep coming back to this because I think this is the problem that we wanted to highlight today is that when, when we want to talk about seniors or immigrants, what we're really talking about are senior immigrants and trying to figure out those issues and a very specific measurement of how we're, how we're connecting to them. And on the labor issue and the PPE, I am not going to be okay with just giving senior centers PPE. What we need to do is figure out how, how to really isolate that or dis disaggregate that population and ensure that they have what they need to go to work because they have to go to work, they have to pay their bills, and and that's that's what we're looking for right now. So that's yeah, no, and you're and you're yeah. right. We I can tell you that the Department for the Aging we did not do that because one we don't have an older worker pro program and we have been looking at it as a totality, right? And so in that sense, you're absolutely correct. And um, and we and obviously immigrant workers whether they're older or not, are not uh, one of our, our wheelhouses. So it's one of the things that we will look with Moya and see how we can support their efforts to make sure that the respective agencies or operations that work with uh, uh, immigrant workers, uh, and particularly those that are older, that we can have some kind of uh, uh, collaboration. I mean, what I could have. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Council Member. Um, I, I would just add, um, just for for awareness here, I think that uh, on PPE distribution, just as Moya specifically, we've really tried to fill gaps. And so, just to give a few examples of what that might look like. So, uh, where we know, for example, there are senior programs that don't work with DIFTA. I can name a few in Queens, for example, uh, say the Himalayan Elders Project, or in Richmond Hill, there's been a, a number of them that we've sort of worked with uh, who, you know, maybe operate out of a house of worship or, um, you know, who, who aren't necessarily, who are newer in nature and, and, and uh, in their work and, and, and you know, haven't had uh, contracts with the city before, we've really tried to identify those for PPE distribution as well, just intentionally trying to reach out to those. And also throughout the pandemic have been providing PPE to immigrant serving CBOs, sort of regardless of who they work for. But I think what you're highlighting is obviously very valuable. And, and so as part of that, you know, that's the work that we've been doing is identifying where some of those gaps might be, but certainly want to think more deeply about how we can be more systematic about uh, targeting that to the populations you're speaking and working with our sister agencies to do that. Well, and I'm going to offer an idea and a space to do some co-organizing and co-governing with, and that's our deliveristas that are across multiple uh, immigrant communities who are delivering food and who are asking for justice right now. Um, and I've been organizing with them to really understand what's, what's, what's the need. And so many of these issues are connected to the questions that I've asked you today about seniors working on an e-bike delivering. They are working uh, and they are immigrant uh, and they are older <laughs> adults in the city of New York and they're asking for PPE. And they're asking for understanding their rights and they're asking for a regulation around their apps. And so we're, we're working on that. And so I'm hoping you can help to ensure that the council does this as quickly as possible, because if we don't have the administration on, on board, uh, it makes it harder uh, and not impossible. <laughs> we'll do it if we have to, but it, does, it makes it harder. And so this is the opportunity, I think, that, that we wanted to take in this hearing to, to highlight the population focus and create data points so that we can measure our success. And my last question is um, to both of you uh, as DIFTA and Moya uh, in, and in your assisting of the DOHMH work in the vaccination of New Yorkers, uh, is Moya and DIFTA providing expertise on how to do this outreach specifically to older immigrant New Yorkers? And I think uh, Chair Chin had, a, had, a, had some exchange about this, uh, but we're looking for very specific um, ideas that are happening and where we can actually support some of those ideas that are coming through our district offices uh, as, we, as we field phone calls, emails, and doing in-district 
uh, in-person events. Oh, I'm gonna, uh, I, will, I will start by saying that we work closely, very closely uh, with the vaccine on cultural competence, language access, um, wheelchair access, all kinds of accessibilities when it comes to older New Yorkers. And as I said, one of the things that we look at is cultural competence and language, and we're looking at it as communities of color as a whole, and not specifically disaggregating it by immigrant status. So, um, and that is my takeaway from this hearing is to make sure that we disaggregate things so that we can see are we targeting specifically for immigrants differently than maybe communities as a whole. I know in certain areas we are, but maybe not as a whole. So we are working very, very closely with them. And I must say that they have been rather responsive and ensuring that uh, the information is available. And there is a, you know, there is a uh, language um, access staff designated at the, uh, at the at any vaccine pod and but as everything you know things happen and should should there be any gaps that you know of please let us know so and let the vaccine command center staff know because everyone's committed to making sure that no new yorker is left behind or marginalized because of language or culture um nick i'll turn it over to you uh, it's a great question. I also want to circle back to your earlier point and offer Council Member uh, Chairman Chaka. Um, no one has been a, a greater advocate on this issue than you. And uh, we absolutely look forward to the opportunity to partner to reach additional delivery workers. I'd say with PPE and, and, and our Know Your Rights presentations, we've definitely uh, done a lot of work in this area, including you know, delivering PPE to, to e-bike shops and um, to, to worker centers, et cetera. But certainly this is an area where we care passionately about our immigrant workers, our, our delivery uh, workers um, who are, are seniors and, and beyond. So certainly we'll be in touch and would love to partner and love the opportunity to partner with you to, to, and, to reach and more we're people. Really, and we're really pleased that the focus of the city field uh, operation is going to be for delivery workers and, and uh, target populations. And so that that is also a, a big step in that direction. So I thank you. I thank you um, for that, for your persistence in this. And, you know, I, you know this has been a lifelong mission for me. So um, I, I, I welcome every ally that we can in this conversation. Mine has not been immigrants as much as language and culture, but and it's evolved over time, so thank you. Well, thank, thank you both. And uh, please send my regards to Commissioner Mustofi uh, from Moya. And we look forward to following up on the questions about the data points. And uh, I'm gonna hand it back to Harbani for other questions from the council members and for the rest of the panels. Thank you, be safe. And thank uh, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. I'm now going to turn it back to Chair Chin for additional questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple of other questions is that when we're talking about um, older workers, I just want to make sure that we don't forget uh, the home health aide, the home attendant, the one that are the caregiver that's taking care of our senior. So we've been advocating with the vaccine command center is that when we you know, provide the vaccine to the senior, if they're accompanied by the home health aide, give it to the home health aide at the same time. Uh, so that this way, both of them are protected because it doesn't make sense just to take care of the senior and then meanwhile, the person that accompanied them uh, don't get so, the vaccine. Um, yeah, so we made a step in that direction that at the home health aides are now part of the pr uh, priority class. So that's been a step in the right direction. And I agree with you, we've been advocating for the same thing, two for one. Yes. Um, the other thing, this, uh, Commissioner, is that back in December 2019, a while back, and we were talking about, and then I think there was an assessment that you presented that there is a need for at least uh, 29 new senior centers, and 16 of them are in high need community with large um, immigrant um, older adult population. So well, I think it, I I think guess it was with a the, yes, I'm sorry. I guess with the new RFP that is it's going to be come out. Um, how do we make sure that 
new senior centers really uh, will be there uh, for the older immigrant population. Yeah, so, so thank you for that question. Um, and I think that we're looking at the new RFP to look at not only new senior centers, but also NORCs. And looking again, going at that, that continuum of care that I was talking about earlier that council member Ayala so fortunately gave me the opportunity to mm -hmm. reveal. But it's looking at, at uh, senior centers, uh, older adult clubs and NORCs to start looking at um, where are they needed? And we've identified service gaps, uh, what we call uh, service deserts and making sure, and most, and many of them, as you well know, are in those high need population areas. And also in those areas and communities that have been the most affected by COVID. So it's all of that combination that we're looking at. And it's one of our proposals and working very closely with OMB and the deputy mayor to, to uh, to be in partnership with us as they always are around these kind of issues around the growth and the, and the growing needs. I mean, that's why the, the senior centers, I mean, right now they're not, they're not open, but even when they were open, a lot of them um, could be utilized on the weekend and the evening. It, it's, a great, it's a great resource. And I think with the, the model budget um, that you know, we fought hard money for, and I got to make sure that the money that was promised is in the budget. Um, because did you use that money um, or that criteria for cultural competency? Was that included um, in allocating uh, the funding from the model budget? No, that was separate and apart, but the model budget deals with all of the other, the co-related issues of cultural competency, the food, you know, the, the ability to provide those communities. So, so it, not directly, but indirectly, yes. Um, but the, um, the 5 million was in the budget and we've been addressing some of the emergency needs through some of the, the original care package that the Department for the Aging used. Uh, to live, uh, receive, I'm sorry. Yeah. That was for the food. That was for food. <laughs> that was for the food part. The 10 million yeah. was not there. No, 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 the 10 OMB. million, no, your, no, 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 the 10 million model food budget. Uh, I, we the worked model every budget day. was not there. The, we worked very closely with OMB on this regularly and, um, and we were all, you know, I wish we could have had a guarantee uh, we did have a guarantee, but then COVID happened and the financial crisis that ensued also happened. And so we worked very, very closely with OMB to make sure that we could keep advocating together. And I know that the administration is committed to this as we all are. Yeah, we'll make sure that um, the money is back in because it was in the executive budget in the last budget. And we were so disappointed that it was not um, because Senior population and immigrant seniors, as we said earlier in the hearing, the population is growing. And it's a shame that DIPTA's budget is less than half a percent of the city's budget. So we got to definitely work on increasing that. So, um, and thank you, um, Commissioner, and thank you, uh, Director Nick, for being here. And we have a lot of work to do, and we will look forward to continue our partnership. Thank you. And no I'll one turn can it back have to them. And no one can have a better ally in the aging community than you. And so uh, thank you for your advocacy. Thank um, you. Okay. I'll turn it back to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to quickly ask again if there are any other council member questions at this time. Seeing no hands, I'm going to thank the administration for their testimony. Um, and we will now be um, moving on to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, so we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. 
Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hand. I would now like to welcome our first panel. In order, I will be calling on Christian Gonzalez Rivera, followed by Kevin Jones, followed by Nicole Rojas, followed by Janet Perez, followed by jo Joanne Yu. Christian Gonzalez Rivera, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Christian Gonzalez Rivera, um, and I'm the Director of Strategic Policy Initiatives at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging. Um, we're uh, CUNY's Aging Research and Policy Center and a part of Hunter College. Um, so first of all, thank you, uh, Chair Chin and Chairman Chaka, uh, and of course, members of the committees for, for holding this hearing um, to draw attention to the as Chairman Chaka keeps saying, I mean, the specific needs of the now 51% of older New Yorkers who are immigrants. Uh, so immigrants are now the majority. So this is extremely important to focus on this population. And also, as you pointed out in your, in your opening statements, older immigrants compared to US born older adults on average are more likely to have lower incomes, face language and cultural barriers and have low, lower levels of formal education. Um, but in this testimony, I'd like to uh, specifically draw the council's attention to a problem that's been particularly salient during this pandemic. And that is that lower income immigrants with less than a high school education uh, are the largest group of New Yorkers that do not have access to the internet at home. They are the largest single group of people. Um, and this is information that we uh, draw, that's drawn from a report that we published two weeks ago uh, as Chair Chin and members of the aging committee uh, may recall we presented this two weeks ago, I mean, on the day that it was released. So in brief, um, out of the 1.7 million New Yorkers age 60 and above, uh, one out of every three does not have internet access at home. That's 474,000 people. Um, and having lower levels of formal education was one of the biggest predictors of lacking home um, internet access. Um, and many of these are immigrants, you know, fully 62% of unconnected older New Yorkers with less than a high school degree are foreign born. 62% are foreign born. And this, this alone is about 120,000 people. The vast majority of these have limited profession in English. Half of them are Spanish speakers. 18% speak uh, various Chinese languages. 11% uh, speak Russian and, other, and the remainder speak other languages. That means that bridging the digital divide for older New Yorkers cannot be done without a strategy to reach older immigrants especially those whose primary language is not English. Um, you know, thousands of immigrants with me without meaningful access to the internet have become dependent on others uh, to meet basic needs. And senior centers are, can be important tech amb ambassadors to older New Yorkers, but the capacity to do so is really uneven across the aging services system. I mean, because providers, because of lack of funds, I mean, it's like I've largely had to fend for themselves when it comes to uh, technology access. And so investing in building that capacity should be an important priority uh, for the council and the administration. And not only for the aging services network, but also for organizations such as museums, theaters, public libraries, um, that who can also be effective tech ambassadors to older adults if they have that kind of specialized investment in reaching older adults in particular. Time expired. Um, so just one quick last thing. I mean, it's like, for instance, I mean, immigrant, immigrant run cultural institutions are probably producing content and programming that could be of interest to older immigrants, but they may just not be reaching out to older adults as an audience or making the programming accessible to them. So that's you know why, I mean, it's like not only do we need investment in uh, organizations becoming tech ambassadors within the aging services network, but more generally so that older adults can have access to the full gamut of services available throughout the city. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. And of course, you know, we always remain available to you um, as you think about how New York City can be an even better place to grow older. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Kevin Jones to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Chin and Menchaca and members of the Committees on Aging and Immigration. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy at AARP New York which represents 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. Thanks for taking the time uh, or for providing me with the opportunity to testify today about the challenges that older adult immigrants currently face in New York City, particularly amid the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Over the course of the past decade, New York City's population of older adults has continued to make up a greater share of the city's total population, and immigrants ages 65 and older have driven much of the total growth of the city's older adult population. Soon, more than half of New York City residents above the age of 65 will be immigrants. As older immigrants account for a growing share of New York City's population, studies have found that a total number of individuals living in poverty continues to steadily increase. The, number, uh, the growing rate of poverty among older adult immigrants in New York City should be of special concern for the city as a significant portion of those living in poverty do not have sufficient retirement incomes to cover their expenses, do not qualify for social security benefits, lack sufficient access to affordable loans and banking, and are disproportionately cost burdened by their housing expenses. Despite the, uh, despite the issues that already existed for older adult immigrants in New York City prior to the pandemic, the onset of COVID-19 has also brought about unprecedented challenges for this population. Throughout this crisis, we have heard from our partners about how language barriers have made it much more difficult for older adult immigrants to access city social services, such as home to, uh, homebound delivery meal programs, as well as some of the difficulties in navigating the 311 system for additional support services and public health, excuse me, public health information on the virus. In addition, we have heard that many older adults, particularly in the Asian community, have often been afraid to leave their homes due to the rise of hate crimes targeting Asian populations. In an effort to better serve older adult immigrants communities during, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, during the COVID-19 pandemic and in the future, we urge that the city ensure all of its service, uh, services provided to older adults from homebound meal delivery programs to the Department for the Aging's wellness check-in calls to the city's efforts to provide iPads and other internet enabled devices to seniors are implemented with sensitivities to any language barriers that exist to ensure that older adult, excuse me, older immigrant adults have the same opportunity to access these vital services as any other aging individual in New York City. We know that working, uh, we know that the work of supporting our city's older adult immigrant population could not be done without the hard work of the, of the city's network of small nonprofit and community based organizations that are based in immigrant communities. We encourage the city to utilize this network of smaller providers uh, more and allocate additional funds to support homebound meal delivery programs and similar services. These providers are critical to serving older adults in immigrant communities since they have built trust and strong relationships within these communities and are often better equipped to reach older adults who have traditionally been underserved by the city's network of social services. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to provide any additional information as needed. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Nicole Rojas to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nicole Rojas. I'm the community organizer at Mixteca Organization, and I'd like to thank everyone uh, for your time today. Um, and I just want to speak about uh, a little bit of the services we've been providing at Mixteca Organization. Um, we've been providing services to the adult uh, immigrant community and older immigrant uh, community in Sunset Park for 20 years. Um, our, our work mainly started with HIV awareness and 20 years later, we're, we're here again in the midst of the COVID pandemic, um, providing information on COVID-19 testing um, and vaccines. And we've seen a, a high need in our community. Uh, many of our immigrant community do not have access to internet. Um, language access is very important as well. And a reminder that our Im immigrant community, the one we serve, do not um, not only speak Spanish, but they also speak indigenous languages like Mixteco, Nahuatl, Quiche, este, Quechua. So it's very important um, that we have all the resources possible in order to serve this community. Also in the midst of a new administration, providing hope for a pathway to citizenship. Our older immigrant community is vulnerable to a lot of scams and fraud. So we definitely need a lot of support in providing legal services for these communities, as well as debunking myths. Also in the midst of uh, the rollout for COVID vaccines, it's very important uh, for this to be accessible for our older immigrant community. And part of the culture is to uh, be informed. Um, so we, we need the services to to do this, uh, a lot of our immigrant community, uh, we it, it takes a long time in order for Im information to get to them. So like, as I mentioned, internet as access has been a, a big one, uh, food access, uh, rent assistance, 
So uh, we've seen a, a, lot, a high need in the community and we really ask for your support to keep uh, funding these services um, as it's very needed. So I'd like to thank all of you for, for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Janet Perez to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this time to speak. Thank you, Council Member and Chair, uh, for this time and others for raising these pressing issues and concerns for the Asian immigrant community. Uh, so my name is Janet Perez, Director of Programs at Mixteca, located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, as a community-based organization that has been on the front lines of the pandemic since April, Mixteca has witnessed firsthand the hardships and challenges undocumented immigrant community members have faced from losing their loved ones, livelihood, and unable to make uh, ends meet. We have seen an increasingly number of older immigrants that continue to heavily rely on the family units to survive during the pandemic. Uh, we would like to highlight that in order to support the aging immigrant community, it is equally important to provide support to the, care, to the caregivers as well, who are also included or excluded from any relief benefits due to status. Um, in recent months, Mixteca has seen or has seen a trend in the community where many community members are either moving back um, with their children or the younger immigrant families are now taking on their aging immigrant community member. And so this is why we, it is, we feel it is definitely important to continue to advocate not only for uh, resources or support services directly for the aging immigrant community, but for their families as well. Um, so thank you for your time. And, and these issues are the as an immigrant, uh, as a younger immigrant community that often uh, comes or um, we may, they may be a younger population, but we've also witnessed that many uh, established undocumented immigrant families are also aging as the years come by. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Joanne Yu to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Joanne Yu and I'm the Executive Director of the Asian American Federation. I am here to offer testimony on two issues that are critical to the Pan-Asian community, that of language access for immigrant New Yorkers and the importance of increasing direct services capacity in our community, especially during the pandemic. As you know, 70% of our city's Asian community boasts an immigrant heritage, but we are also seeing challenges because of the sheer number of languages spoken in our homes and the accompanying lack of accessibility to vital information. One of four of our seniors lives in poverty and high percentages are limited English proficient, a combination that makes accessing services very difficult and compounds, um, compounds existing isolation. Um, the COVID crisis has, crisis has exacerbated challenges for our already vulnerable seniors with widespread food insecurity, mental health issues, social isolation, and now confusions about how, how to sign up for vaccines. The emergency amongst our community seniors is occurring behind closed doors where basic needs are not being met and social isolation is compounding issues in our community where our seniors serve a critical social role. Our senior serving member agencies are working beyond capacity to support our elders and they are creating innovating processes to make sure our seniors are getting the services they need as efficiently and safely as possible, like using meal delivery to con uh, uh, conduct, conduct mental health checks with trained volunteers in Queens or sourcing, uh, sourcing culturally competent food from local growers of Asian vegetables in Brooklyn. From May to November alone, the Federation helped six senior serving organizations to serve almost 3,000 seniors with nearly 20,000 food programs and 8,500 assurance calls. The stories of what our member agency staff, as well as all nonprofit staff, have been going through is nothing short of heroism. For various contract bureauc uh, bureaucracy reasons, the Pan Asian community senior serving groups are woefully under resourced. These challenges have been brought to the attention of our district commissioner. And we are working together to ensure that our seniors do not go without food or medical services. Our seniors depend on our community-based organizations who are leading by example 
and compensating for shortfalls um, in existing city programs. But our CBOs need the full backing of our city with RFP processes that account for the uh, capacity limitations of smaller service providers and contracting reforms that prioritize CBOs with expertise in reaching isolated but hard hit ethnic and linguistic communities. With the looming budget cut, our advocacy effort and our budget ask is that um, our nonprofits be provided enough resources to protect essential Time expired. to support our elders. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to Council Member Menchaca for any questions. Uh, thank you. And I wanna say thank you for this first panel. Uh, all of you represent some of the more critical infrastructure that's on the ground. And so I want to focus my questions on really connecting to what I was trying to get out of the Q&A part, which is the interactions between DIFTA and Moya as it pertains to supporting you all. Um, maybe, maybe we can start with uh, Joanne and maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about all the work that you've just out, uh, laid out. Uh, how have you felt support coming from DIFTA and Moya as they engage each other to support uh, culturally relevant food to community members, for example, or some of the worker and labor issues around PPE? And have you felt supported and can give us any idea and rep uh, recommendations on how to just better understand that? Is it happening? Are you getting support? Um, sure. Uh Thank you for that question. Um, I guess a lot of our connection to the both commissioners is the fact that we, you know, through our work together for many, many years, you know, we have a, it's, it's at this point become personal relationships, right? And so they do call us regularly. They check in all the time. Anytime there's been, we've had direct phone, uh, you know, phone numbers to both commissioners at any time there's an issue where we know that no, you know, you know, there's a lot of hemming and hawing in, you know, in bureaucracy, we're able to call the commissioners. Um, Moya has included us in part of the OSF funding um, and we were able to get that, the funding out, a lot of it actually in um, your district, uh, uh, Council Member Menchaca, and we're really proud of that. There were a lot of, we worked with a lot of our member agencies who normally wouldn't be able to access some of the fund, fundings like that to be able to get uh, services out. Um, with the DIFTA commissioner, you know, we are, you know, we were at the height of sitting and working through the RFP process and talking about how do we really talk about contract reform so that that way it's fair for the smaller nonprofits that serve the Asian American community. Um, and then COVID hit. And so like, I think we were just slammed and we were pretty stymied, but I know that those conversations are, are happening again. In fact, I have a meeting with them this afternoon. Um, but I think um, we do talk to them regularly. They do, they do understand. Um, I think, um, you know, the um, uh, Commissioner uh, Cortez Vasquez comes from our side of the world, right? It's, she's uh, she's the head, the Hispanic Federation, which, you know, which is our sister organization. So even before I went in there and said, let me tell you what I'm seeing, she already knew and she already, we're already talking and we're already having plans. And I know that she, I know for a fact that there's been very robust conversation with our member agencies and DIFTA uh, because we do, we're trying to get to the solution. Um, you know, where I think it's just, you know, not, you know, you both know, I have no problems speaking my mind and being an advocate. Um, but I think at this point, there is just, you know, what we're trying to all do right now is the shared commitment of like getting everybody vaccinated. There's so much confusion. There's so many challenges of even, you know, it's simple supply and demand where we can't even get people vaccinated. Um, you know, and there's so much that needs to happen. Uh, PPE, you know, whenever I have asked for any, um, the city has always been able to step up. Test and Trace has been really great to respond to us. But the other reality is that a lot of our uh, smaller organizations, a lot of our uh, small businesses, a lot of the folks from our own community, the Pan-Asian community that could access PPE have been stepping up. And they're saying, I have 5,000 masks I'm flying in from, you know, Korea, for instance, right? And I want to share with these nonprofit groups um, and we want to, you know, and um, we've been able to really spread that love around uh, because we know what it's taking. Um, and um, you know, one of the one of the challenges that we see is just, you know, the the 
inequality of funding. Um, you know, who gets what money? It's always the big agencies that get funded. Um, but a lot of the, uh, the Federation members are smaller nonprofit organizations that serve seniors. And those seniors need to be uplifted too. And so some of the stories that I've heard from our senior organizations, um, those stories I readily share with uh, uh, Council Member Chen, you know, about how senior serving organizations are no longer just senior serving. They're also having to do MWVE contract applications so that that way the restaurants could feed the seniors. Um, you know, those stories are heartbreaking because I know, um, and that's why it was really important for me just personally as an executive director to uplift my counterparts in um, our member agencies in the nonprofit world. I'm gonna to try to say this without crying because I think it has just been extraordinary. Um, and this has been really scary. And I think, you know, a lot of the reports talk about the Asian American community, you know, nobody, I'm gonna be be honest and say, you know, the frustration is very real. Thank you for, thank you to Kevin, um, you know, my longtime AARP colleague who talked about the hate crimes, right? And our seniors are afraid to leave the house because they're, they are they don't know what's gonna happen. Um, you know, tonight is a vigil for Mr. Quintana who was going to work and he's got his face slashed. There is so much happening. And um, our nonprofit, our member agencies are doing extraordinary things with almost nothing. They're making things work. And I don't even know how, you know, but if we didn't have them, our seniors would not be fed. So, you know. Um, thank you for, yeah. yeah, just thank you for for uh, lifting up the, the Federation organizations. I, I'm with you. We had these conversations during the census com uh, uh, work. And and so this is real. And, and the burden lift, um, the burden is is held by you all on the ground, and this is this is what I think uh, Chair Chen and I are trying to really figure out where where is that gap, and and so maybe a question for some of the other providers, and I just want to say thank you to Christian for bringing data that we were asking Moya to to answer, uh, and and so you had it you had it, and so thank you so much for some of those pieces. Uh, you are an expert on on this population specifically. This Venn diagram that comes together around immigrants and elders in the city of New York, and uh, and and Kevin also really pointing to the fact that this is where the 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 face of our our elders um, this is who they are. And and so maybe we can hear from Exteca about some of the gaps. What we want to find out are gaps. How how do we see and understand the gaps? And, and I heard a lot of indigenous languages that are coming through the district in Sunset Park where I am council member. And, and so how is Moya and DIFTA supporting you in connecting to, to our, our neighbors uh, who have those language access issues who are elder, uh, elder immigrant adults? Uh, yeah, thank you for raising that concern. So, I mean, we've seen uh, with now with the pandemic and everything going virtual, there's been a lot more needs for techn technology access. Uh, a lot of community members don't have access to internet as well. Um, so we have seen that Mixteca has played a pivotal role in really connecting community members to services, to city services. So even like applications, rent relief uh, applications or other resources that are, are available to community members. Um, so we've definitely seen that language access has played a big role, especially for our indigenous immigrant community members who we have to really uh, play that role in interpretation, which can sometimes take long because uh, those languages are not always available. So, I mean, we've seen many different gaps in, in terms of uh, language access, technology access, uh, with the new virtual world, it's even harder for community members to really access those resources. And as many folks have mentioned, even connecting through the phone, it is also very uh, intimidating for community members. Um, and so what we've seen for us that works is we continue to offer in-person services. Um, and when we do, we often see like an exaggerated amount of community members reaching out to Mixteca. Um, and really the capacity um, is not always there. So we would love to, uh, you know, work something out or something that works uh, can work for the community.
Uh, I want to follow up with this question about how DIFTA and Moya can support the the work that you, that you just described. And, and I'm talking about uh, reaching more immigrant New Yorkers, elder immigrant New Yorkers. And, and so this is the opportunity to talk about some of that work so that the council can work through a budget or policy issue that we can that we can change and make and make better. And I just want to ask if um, if the DIFTA and Moya representative that are here, you can uh, say hi. I want to make sure that we still have DIFTA and Moya in the room. And um, because they need to be here listening to this, I just want to make sure that Um, I think um, my colleague um, Lorena is trying to unmute herself. Okay. <laughs> Whoever has access. And if I could just share quickly also, um, um, Moya has been supporting um, with uh, funding um, for the financial relief for our community members. And we've worked with them for Know Your Rights workshops as well. Um, with reporting rise, reporting wise, we also do let them know um, that there is an indigenous speaking community. Um, and it's great to, to, to make them visible, but now we, we really do need the support to provide these services. So information in these languages, and also a reminder that a lot of these folks that do speak these languages are undocumented. And, mm -hmm. and um, we can't hire them as much as we uh, as we want to to pro to to make these services available to the rest of the community that speak these languages. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> unmuting myself. I just wanted to add the we received some support from Moya and we fundraise ourselves to put to put money on their hands of the elderly and immigrant community. And one of our first. Uh, category was to speak an indigenous language as the first language. And the, the resources are not enough. We got super excited with the first money we got. We got excited with the money we were able to fundraise with the first boxes of food, with the first uh, cultural appropriate food, putting in the boxes with our, all the resources that we've been able to put over there and there are not enough. The community is huge. And I think what is happening is that is a community that we haven't seen. And I wanna say that when Moya gave us that money, we put out an application, really candid. We were thinking like we have a lot of money and let's distribute in the best way. We received 4,500 application in three days. And then we were like, what are we gonna be doing with this huge amount of people and we discovered that there are 59 different languages, indigenous languages spoken in Brooklyn. And uh, we just were like unable to solve all those, all that situation, even though we've been doing a lot of work. And now with the vaccine, I think it's important, it's a priority that these people that are the real and the original dreamers, because they've been the day laborers, they've been the ones coming to this country to try to provide for their own families. It's like there are, I don't know, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's hard to, to witness what is happening with our community and, and in particular with the elderly community that are every Saturday lining up to get some food and not talking about all the resources or people that are sick and they can go and pick up the food. It's, it's really, those are basic rights. And, and I am with you, Joe and you, because it's really hard when we, when we really think in our young community and being in this situation is hard. But seeing the immigrant elderly working all their entire life, it's really heartbreaking. And, and yes, there are some resources, but what I want to say is not enough. We at Mixteca we got some cuts last year, and thank you, uh, Council Member Menchaca, because 
you rescue us and uh, we were able to continue working, but uh, still a lot of need, a huge need, and we have to develop new strategies to approach this community if we really want them to be vaccinated, if we really want to address the issues. It's not as easy as we believe, it's not as easy. My coworkers already mentioned the difficulties accessing to the internet the needs, the beliefs, we got to really work hard if we want to work and address this situation. And, and I'm sorry for getting too emotional on this one. No, gracias, uh, Lorena, por, por, por la voz que viene uh, duro y con coraje. Uh, just thank you so much for that voice. Uh, we need to hear that voice from you and, and Joanna and everyone today about what the need is. This is the only way we're going to be able to get to that that goal if we understand it deeply. Uh, and when it comes with emotion, it comes with 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 truth. And so just keep showing up with that. Uh, Joanne, I think you had your hand up as well. Um, I did. I wanted, I really want to um, shout out um, all the great work that Moya is doing as far as all the translations go. We get a lot of materials and, you know, on Twitter, they tag us and which we in turn um, share with our member agencies. And there's a lot of really rapid, quick, you know, five second reads that Moya is producing. And we, I, I see that, I see that popping up in the Federation Twitter. I really appreciate that, but um, you know, where the challenge is and why I know Lorena and I are really um, emotional is because a lot of our seniors, immigrant seniors um, aren't even literate in their own language and they don't have Twitter. So we need to figure out all the different ways that we can convey information. And now more than ever, getting information to people, that's critical. You know, that is like, how do you get the vaccine? How do you sign up for food? It's it's not even, you know, um, this is where you can go get a senior center and go relax with your friends, but this is really life-saving work. And this is why the nonprofits on the ground in every corner, explaining things and letting people drop by and talk to them. This is why our work is critical. And I think this is why Lorena and I are very emotional because we know what, what it takes and we know what it, what it's doing to our, our field and our staff, because you know a lot of these folks, they don't even think about their own safety because their own family safety, they're going out and trying the best they can. And the things that we're seeing, I mean, you know, it's, it's hell out here and we really need the council to stand up for uh, the nonprofit organizations. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna hand it back to, uh, to our committee council. And what, what I just wanna say is, I think we had Jean Bay from Moya uh, 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 say hi. Um, I don't know if Diff does here as well. Um, I know we can't force you to keep your cameras on, but, but we need you to stay present in this hearing. The words that we're gonna hear from so many New Yorkers that are talking about some of our most vulnerable, our elder immigrant New Yorkers, our adults that feel invisible to everything and everyone right now need to be heard. And so we can't force you to keep your cameras on, but I'm going to ask you to do that from DIFTA and from Moya. Uh, back to you, Harbani. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. I'm going to turn it to Chair Chen for questions. Yes, um, thank you. I wanted to really thank um, this panel for your testimony and for all your hard work you know, for our immigrant community and our seniors. I, I just wanted to, to say that we need to support um, these CBOs in our community, especially the small one that are serving population that the city has not recognized or don't even know about. And that's what the council, you know, comes in. And I just urge you um, to make sure that if you are a 501c3, nonprofit, then apply for council funding. Put in an application. That's the only way that we can sort of help you support you in your center for immigrant population. The council are the one that we are the one that are out there helping uh, organization in our community uh, that serve um, the population that are in need. So for the, the, the panelists that testify, I hope that um, you know about the application, um, it's online and the deadline is coming soon. So put something in, 
and then we can get you, you know, more support. And maybe there's a way that we could think of um, doing some initiative that can support these organizations that serve um, population that the city's not even aware of, and the different languages and dialects um, that are needed. So I really wanted to uh, to make sure that you know that we are here for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chin. I'd like to now ask if there are any other council member questions. Seeing no hands, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I'll be calling Margaret Garrett, followed by Pia Scarfo, followed by Sharanya Pillai, followed by Felicia Singh, followed by Jocelyn Gore. Margaret Garrett, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for putting together this testimony, this hearing today. My name is Margaret Garrett. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society and I'm representing the Legal Aid Society today at this hearing. Thank you again for including us in this discussion about what is affecting the older immigrant population in New York City. I, I feel honored to be part of this and to be able to learn from all of you and all your testimony that you've delivered on their behalf. <clears throat> Older New Yorkers face a range of distinct barriers to accessing services that are often only heightened for members of immigrant communities. The problems of isolation, reduced mobility, and other threats to individuals' ability to live independently are further complicated by issues experienced by members of non-citizen communities. Language and cultural barriers combined with different levels of education pose a significant obstacle to many older immigrant New Yorkers attempting to navigate complex and bureaucratic government assistance programs. This means that in addition to having on average far lower incomes and far smaller retirement savings than US born residents, older immigrant New Yorkers are less able to access vital services and receive fewer benefits from government programs. This is compounded by higher levels of institutional distrust experienced by many members of immigrant communities. These have only been exacerbated by the Trump administration's overtly anti-immigrant agenda, including damaging changes to public charge regulations. For undocumented New Yorkers, the situation could be even more dire as they are shut out of many programs that are frequently the only available source of income and assistance for individuals unable to continue working. The difficulties for older immigrant New Yorkers in accessing vital services during the pandemic have made it that they are more likely to forego vaccination out of concern for potential costs or worry that obtaining it may lead to negative immigration related consequences. I have personally have spoken to older non-citizen immigrants who are concerned about accessing the vaccine. Many non-citizen New Yorkers are deeply concerned about the collection and sharing of their personal information with federal agencies, which they fear could leave them open to future immigration, immigration enforcement actions. These unique challenges facing vulnerable older immigrant New Yorkers across the city point to the need for dedicated services and outreach catering to these members of our community. Uh, thank you to the city again for inviting us to speak on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. We look forward to future discussions. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Pia Scarfo to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, the Committee on Immigration and the Committee on Aging to give us the opportunity to testify today. And um, there are like, the Vision Urbana has been uh, providing three main services to the community. 
So we are running <clears throat> an ORC program and the Senior Center for Immigrant Population. They're both based on discretionary funding. And uh, I don't know if the commissioner is still with us, but what I would like to share with you is that Vision Urbana has not been included because based on discretionary funding on the weekly uh, brief that the Department for the Aging has been giving. So we've been receiving information and updates uh, from indirect sources. And now, thanks to our program officer from uh, uh, the, the NORC program and the Senior Center program, we are, uh, we, we, we keep, we are informed, but we're still no part of this briefing. So, um, so Vision Urbana, as I said, we have an ORC program, we have a Senior Center for Immigrant Population, and we're also running a food pantry. So since the pandemic, we've been uh, changing the way the services were provided. Our food pantry uh, became an express food pantry. So we do home delivery to our community, to our seniors and immigrant population. Uh, regarding the NORC program, we've been providing case assistance, and case management and health management over the phone or restrict in a very restrictive way uh, in person when absolutely necessary. In terms of our uh, food program, as I said, we had the, the, the food pantry. Now, um, the main concern, there are three main concerns that Vision Urbana would like to raise and need your help to deal with this problem. The first one is the vaccination. Our older minority elder population, there is no enough vaccination side. I'm sorry, we're located in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I didn't say that at the beginning. So the Vision Urbana is working with the Department of Health to open a vaccination site here in the community. So we'll be happy to share good news with you, um, Mr. Machaca and, uh, and Councilwoman Margaret Chin, we hope very soon. The second thing is uh, senior center. We need a senior center to go back and provide meals to the seniors. Even if they're close, they need to give them the opportunity to go and get their food. The third thing is the digital program. The digital literacy is very low. Vision Urbana has been giving out tablets, giving training and doing Zoom classes, but we need to do more and we need more money to do more and provide this help to other community. So, you know, I, I've been rushing through the three minutes. I'm very <laughs> glad that I, I can spoke and, and, and I hope fine. I can share more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sharanya Pillai to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Chin and Chairman Chaka for giving the opportunity to testify regarding issues specific to aging immigrant populations. I'm writing from India Home, um, the largest senior center program dedicated to South Asian seniors. 100% of the clients we serve are immigrants and are of 60 years of age and older. As you know, the populations we serve have been with exacerbated crises on many levels due to COVID-19. Not only have the losses been numerous, but the pre-existing public health disparities have been exacerbated. Food insecurity, as mentioned earlier, has made it difficult for South Asian older adults. Um, we have been providing culturally competent home, deliver, home delivered halal meals to the population in Jamaica, Queens, and grocery deliveries to seniors all over Queens. However, we know there is more of a need and we are at capacity. Furthermore, the, immigration pop, the immigrant populations we serve are already at high risk for social isolation, which makes times like now especially hard. We're providing virtual programs now, seven days a week to combat this isolation and providing individualized training for seniors to join these programs. However, we do not have adequate technology assistance or capacity to support these programs in their full. On that note, while digital access allows a world, world of opportunities during COVID, as you know, this does not translate for our older adults. Applications for benefits such as cash, cash assistance, SNAP and SSI all have to be done online, which is inequitable for seniors. The waiting time on the phone to access these benefits is even longer than before, and it makes it extremely difficult for our seniors to be able to enroll in these benefits during such times of need. Furthermore, the interpretation services that are there to access government services or assistance are inadequate. Many of our clients who have limited English proficiency don't know how to navigate through 311 to get through all the steps to be able to access that interpretation and get their needed, needed assistance for benefits. 
a huge point of difficulty as has been addressed earlier has been accessing the COVID of Queens and especially in Eastern Queens makes it less e equitable for our clients to get vaccinated. On top of sites themselves being unavailable in a low level of supply, the vaccine appointment procedure is complicated and it's especially difficult for seniors who love digital literacy and have language problems to access online services. Many of our seniors do not have internet, a smartphone or another device, or even an email address to be able to navigate the system. Especially the seniors who are living by themselves are affected as they don't have the support to be able to help book the vaccine. We have we seniors who are more than 70, 75 years old, and they all want to, they don't have an email address, et cetera, and, and we can't register on their behalf. Um, and if there is a form to fill out, you know, how will they fill it out if they don't have internet or if they don't have a printer or don't know how to use a printer? So there's so many of such barriers to making the appointment, which makes us feel helpless, given so many barriers for our community to be able I'm to inspired. access what should be a basic right. We know the registration phone line was meant to be a more accessible solution for seniors. However, there's not language interpretation through the vaccine finder phone line for the South Asian languages that is needed. These systems need to be improved to ensure equal access to immigrant communities. We urge the city and government agencies to provide language support and accessible methods for South Asian immigrant older adults to access these crucial services. We urge that vaccination sites are placed in more ac accessible areas for communities in which our South Asian seniors live. And we urge the support to increase the capacity of direct so service organizations such as ours that will help bring our communities to a more equitable future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Felicia Singh to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Um, the camera isn't on. Oh, she's ready. My name is Felicia Singh, and I'm a daughter of a taxi driver. He is an immigrant from Punjab, India, and he's 66 years old and still drives, drives his taxi today because he's unable to retire. The New York Taxi Workers Alliance has a sound, right, and doable plan for debt relief, one that has been approved by our comptroller and attorney general, Tish James. Our city has not protected our aging immigrants, and this has happened on all of our watch. The medallion crisis is so real. My father has had no choice but to file for bankruptcy because of this medallion. The same medallion he was told he could sell, and there went our income. On February 5th, 2021, the bankruptcy court put a for sale, for sale sign on our house. You make us working class and you make us stay in this position forever by design. You want us to be working class because we do the work of serving all of you. The city has been built on our backs and in time of need, you've given us false promises. The taxi get ta the taxi cab medallion sale prices task force believes that quote, taking no action at all would only exacerbate the problems that are currently stifling this industry. But we've been telling you this. The question is, when is our mayor and our city council going to find the moral compass to do something about it? You have 85 days, 85, to push the mayor to adopt the debt relief plan by New York Taxi, Taxi Workers Alliance, or my family and I will be unhoused. And so will many other families of taxi drivers. Every day, I am going to remind the mayor and this city and city council how many days we have left to, to, uh, until you uphold the promise to center working class immigrants by giving us the debt relief we deserve. This is what seniors are facing right now. This is the pain. This is the intersectionality behind allowing predatory lenders to do this to seniors who now have to work for the rest of their lives in New York City to pay something they should have been able to retire on. It is our responsibility. We need to find the will and the courage to step forward and do something. Time is running out. I will lose my house in 85 days because of bankruptcy, because of the United States Bankruptcy Court. This is what's happening to our seniors. It is irresponsible, it is negligent, and you all are responsible for this. We need to take action now and I will remind city council every day that there is a plan that exists via the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, and there's a refusal to adapt it. 
Thank you. I'm for your Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Jocelyn Gore to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Jocelyn Carr, and thank you to everyone for hosting this really important session. And um, I'm here to testify as a lifetime Glen Oaks resident in East Queens, which is home to one of the largest senior populations in our entire city. I am here to testify on behalf of my father, Pratap Singh, who is 62 years old this year and has been a taxi driver and medallion owner for over three decades now, um, which for me is uh, about as a 24 year old means that I have seen my father wake up at 4 a.m. for his entire for my entire life for 16 hour shifts for nearly as long as I have been alive. That also means that I have intimately known the medallion crisis for seven years without an end, end in sight. Today, I spent my morning alongside Felicia Singh, who just spoke before me, and the New York Taxi Workers Alliance with organizers who have spent these years demanding that our mayor bail out the workers who have kept our city moving. And that is what's at the crux of my testimony today, as our city has categorically failed to address the taxi medallion debt crisis. Among them were people who look just like my father, older immigrants speaking a number of languages, people who have lost their loved ones to suicide. My father immigrated to New York with the understanding that owning your own yellow cab was akin to striking gold. But what he, my family, and thousands of workers across our city understand now is that we have struck deep misfortune instead. Our city knew that the taxi medallion industry markets were fraudulently inflating the values of medallions while allowing brokers to continue putting our immigrant workers into a lifetime sentence to debt, disenfranchisement, and in the most deeply disturbing cases, death. The same year the medallion bubble burst, I was meant to start my first year of university. But in addition to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medallion debt, I incurred tens of thousands of dollars worth of student loan debt to finance my education. The city promised people like my father a pathway to put a mortgage on a home and to send their kids to great schools. But what we now have is insurmountable debt, a home that's been refinanced and years spent on food stamps. Our city is complicit in predatory lending and the manufactured negligence of immigrants who are now in their senior years, living even more precarious lives than when they first arrived here in New York City. But our mayor continues to kick the can down the road, telling us that someone should do something about this while our seniors remain food and housing insecure. I want our council and our mayor to know that we can't lose another person to debt. We can't lose and continue to curtail the right to a dignified life for the nearly 950 taxi drivers who have filed for bankruptcy for the nearly 25% of drivers who have contracted COVID-19, especially for senior immigrant drivers like my father, who never stopped working. And I can't even get him an appointment, even with the new city field vaccination site that's opened up in Queens. Owning a medallion should never mean signing your life away. And under our current system, we will continue to see people like me, children of immigrants being the retirement funds for our parents and grandparents. I can't wait to see my father stop working but it's time for our city to work for them to grant retirement funds, pensions, return stolen wages with direct services and the array of languages our drivers speak from Bangla, Punjabi, and Man I'll close with this, that refinancing medallion debt would cost our city $75 million across 20 years, making monthly payments only at an estimated $800 a month instead of well over $2,000 a month. Our controller already agrees that this is a viable plan. We just need our mayor and our council to amass the political will to put this plan into action. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to Chairman Chaka for questions. Uh, I wanna thank this panel again for reminding us about the intersectional conversation that we're having here today uh, and that our seniors are working. Uh, they're working many times because they have to. Uh, and so I want to thank uh, the uh, the testimony from both Felicia uh, and Jaslyn, who have really brought to us uh, a very long term conversation that we've been having at the city without a lot of political will to change it. Uh, and so maybe I'll ask both of you to uh, commit time to sit with me and my team to review this plan. I uh, want to get to know the the inner inners and inner outer components of this plan and you have my commitment to sit down and learn about what's happening exactly, uh, not just to your families, but to the many elder immigrant workers who cannot retire at this point and who are in bankruptcy. 
Uh, I know that the council has a lot of role to play in this. And so I wanna be a champion within the city council uh, and that this is gonna be a budget conversation, which means that we have to start thinking about that now. Uh, and so we're gonna need that support. We're gonna need, need that pressure. Um, both council member Chin and I are on the budget negotiation teams, which means that uh, we need to get that going and learn about what's happening so that we can actually be the best advocates we can, we can be. Uh, and so maybe that's my question to, to both of you. Will you commit to, to sitting down with my team uh, at the council to get a better sense of it so that I can, I can be an advocate for you? Okay, wonderful. Um, and, and I think uh, with Pia's uh, piece, I wanna just say that the vaccination conversation is gonna be really important. And there are a few vaccination public hearings on its way. Uh, but the language component is where I want to stay focused and ensuring that I can support the rest of the council members on, on ensuring that language access is, is no longer a barrier. Uh, and I've heard some really great comments from, from uh, a lot of you about Moya's commitment to the, the language piece. And so this is just good to hear. We need to hear that in these public hearings, that it's working. And how do we just bring more support to ensure that there's no barrier uh, when it comes to language? to the vaccination sites and bringing a vaccination site to your space as well, working with your council member. Um, and I don't know if that's, if it's council member Chin or Rivera uh, exactly where that falls, but um, I wanna be supportive as the chair of the immigration committee. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks for Bonnie. Thank you, chair. Um, I'd like to turn it to chair Chin for any questions. No, I just wanna make a comment and thank you um, to all the people who testify in this panel and you know for the for the senior center i know pia and you guys work so hard uh serving our seniors and when it comes to language access it's not enough the city's not doing enough they're not comply compile with the uh, local law 30 because most of the time when information gets out it's only in english and then we have to say hey what's the spanish what's the chinese what's the other languages so I think that's something that we need to work with Moya to really strongly advocate on. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, the Taxi Worker Alliance. We've been working with you all these years to try to find a way to help the taxi uh, workers that are suffering right now. And I know that uh, the chair of the Transportation uh, Committee, Council Member Yudanis, um, is also you know, a strong supporter in this. So let's get together and see how we can make this happen uh, to really finally bring some relief because there's been so much tragedy that has happened. And I think we need to work together to bring some solution to this. So I really wanted to thank um, all, the, uh, all the advocacy on this front. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to ask if there are any other council member questions at this time. Seeing no other hands, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony, and we, we're going to be moving on to our next panel. In order, I'll be calling Binta Torre, followed by Richard Chow, followed by Jana Stroh, followed by Jean Renee B. Tanis, followed by William Ritzu, followed by Pervi Desai. Binta Torre, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the older adult immigration population. My name is Binta Torre and I'm an intern at Livon, New York. Um, I'm excited to testify at this hearing because my parents are immigrants and as they're aging, I see the issues older adults in the immigrant population are facing. Livon, New York's members include more than 100 community-based nonprofits that provide core services which allow all New Yorkers to thrive in our communities as we age. Livon, New York's members work to improve the lives of all New Yorkers, including immigrants. And we all know that New York's immigrant seniors now compromise the majority of the city's older adult population. In a 2010 study, 8% of US born elderly live below the poverty line, whereas 16% of foreign born elderly live below the poverty line. It has been found that immigrants compromise 65% of all seniors living in poverty. 
Um, when it comes to gathering immigrant seniors, appropriateness of spaces with regard to culture must also be taken into account. For example, there are instances where Muslim women from traditional families lose their husbands and tend to become more isolated, which is likely due to difficulty finding spaces where it's gender segregated and a place where they can take off their hijab. These challenges, language barriers, financial barriers, and lack of culturally appropriate spaces are important to keep in mind as each can exaggerate the risk of isolation. Isolation must be taken seriously even prior to um, COVID-19 because it's a greater predictor of morbidity um, senior services funded through the Department for the Aging play an important role in combating isolation among older immigrants and ensuring services provided, including males, are offered in a way that is inclusive and culturally competent. Beyond partnering and emergency response, the city must also look to reaffirm its commitment to nonprofit senior service in the budget. Today, the DIFTA budget still accounts for less than 1% of the total city budget, despite a call to provide services to a rapidly increasing and more diverse older adult population. To fully fund the system and thereby improve the ability for providers to serve older, um, older immigrants. Sorry, the following must be prioritized. First, the city must fully fund home delivery meal programs at the national average to ensure programs can continue to provide culturally competent, nutritious meals to homebound seniors across the city. Two, the city must allocate the promised $10 million funding in senior center staff and $5 million funding for senior center kitchen staff. And three, we call for the indirect cost rate to be fully funded. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Richard Chow to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I think we might be having some technical difficulties. I'll move on to the next panelist. Um, I'd like to welcome Jana Stroh to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Your your audio is a little muffled. If you could speak a little louder. I'm sorry, I think we're unable to hear you. We'll circle back. Um, I'm gonna move on to our next panelist. Jean Renee B. Tannis, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you to have me. My name is Jean Renee B. Tannis. My medallion number is 6F20. My license number is 418384. And I am driving yellow cab for 34 straight years. And then I stopped to work. I stopped since March 12 until now. I did not go back to work because of the pandemic. I have a loan for $436,000 with uh, Phil, used to be Melrose, changed to Phil Point. And then uh, right now, I, I am 72 years old. I have no pension, no retirement, no nothing because of the loan I owe. And then uh, I am stick with the union. If they can lower the medallion like 120 or 120, $100,000, and then my loan might coming down uh, to seven fifty or seven hundred thousand dollars. Even I don't go to work, I still have managed with my family to pay the bills, and I I hope the mayor can uh, give us the opportunity for the debt forgiveness, and I will be very happy. Because of I cannot put food on the table, 
I cannot take care of myself because I don't have nothing. And the medallion park home with the taxi, I don't put it yet on the, I don't put it yet on the, with I, on the storage. I still paying insurance without no working, no nothing. But if past six months, I don't know what I'm going to do from now, if I'm going to restore the medallion or uh, and surrender the plate to taxi, uh, to, to motor vehicle. But I hope the mayor understand the panel can understand our suffer and can help us and we will be very happy. Only one thing we need, please, a debt forgiveness because we really cannot afford to pay 2,500, 2,000 anymore. Okay, all right, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I hope the city council says our need. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome William Ritzio to testify. Maybe begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I see that. I, okay. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Chin and uh, uh, all the present uh, panel. Uh, my name is uh, William Ritzio. I am seventy-three year old. I have uh, no pension. I based on social security. I came here a long time ago in 84. I'm living in Astoria, Queens, and I'm a proud member of the Taxi Worker Alliance. When I came here, uh, originally I was uh, uh, to put uh, food on the table, uh, me and my family, I had to work on the taxi, while uh, later on in the evening, and uh, then switching the shifts, I was going uh, to uh, uh, the graduate center, and uh, this is how I am now a PhD, arriving uh, in statistics and uh, even teaching uh, statistics to the uh, CUNY, John Jay College, and so on. But my concern right now is different. I am retired. I have uh, cancer, and uh, the cancer was uh, a surgery two years ago. I hope that will, I will go well. But the problem is that uh, I uh, have a debt with uh, $500 because I didn't give up to the medallion. I said to invest in this uh, medallion. I was driving all the time and it's uh, very impossible to be paid. When I bought the medallion in 2006, uh, the city took the money and took the money for every uh, medallion uh, and uh, we have to pay back the money to the credit union and so on. The city took the money, which we pay very hard. A lot of us are not here because they uh, uh, committed suicide because the, the house and everything was uh, going to be taken and worked taken by the banks and Federal Credit Union. I am in the same situation. We need a debt forgiveness. $125,000, it's a fair way. And uh, the city has to help after they took all the money, they have to help with nothing. 75 million in 20 years is nothing. They just have to do a move. Mayor, uh, the mayor said he is going to help. Now is the time to show that. He got the money from the government, from the federal, from every. Now is the moment. I have no pension. I need a pension. I need. I have help from some other uh, friends. But you cannot stay on your friends. You have to be by yourself. What is this? Uh, I really uh, need uh, your help uh, for the debt forgiveness, especially I'm uh, talking about. And uh, I like to mention that I know very well the uh, senior uh, association in Roosevelt Island when I used to live. I'm expired. I was teaching, yeah, senior, I was teaching uh, senior citizen in the internet, in the email. So now there you have a group uh, of senior citizen who maybe know to go to the internet, thanks to me. I used to thank you very much for your time uh, and uh, thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Harvey Desai to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Bhairavi Desai. I'm the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. It's our proposal that our members are testifying about today. The reason that we're at this joint hearing is because close to 30% of the drivers who filled out our form for debt forgiveness are over the age of 62. The debt forgiveness that yellow cab owner drivers are fighting for is an immigrant senior issue. 93% of them have an active loan. On average, they're paying close to $3,000 a month. Over 64% of them are driving alone. Meanwhile, close to 30% of them either have had COVID and were in the hospital or have been living with a family member or a roommate with COVID. The, the story of the debt forgiveness of this industry is a tragic tale of utter corruption. While the owner drivers have a financial bankruptcy, the city has a moral bankruptcy that it needs to answer to. Our proposal is simple. Bring down all the debts to $125,000, refinance at no more than $757 a month. The city can backstop all of those loans. The city will only have a cost to pay if that loan is delinquent and nobody buys the medallion when it's resold at a higher rate than the balance of that loan at that time. The controller has reviewed our proposal, so has the attorney general. It is financially sound. We're so heartened to hear that, you know, um, Councilman Menchaca say that both council members, Menchaca and Chin, are on the budget negotiations committee. The mayor has said that if the money comes in through the stimulus, he's, you know, it's, he's willing to address this issue. We cannot wait. There are already so many bankruptcies and foreclosures. Our senior members have lost their retirement. They've been working under sheer poverty. At this point, what you can do is free them from a life imprisonment of debt. It is simple for a city of $90 billion a year budget even with a $5 billion deficit, which we know is gonna be addressed with the stimulus funds. Our proposal is only 75 million over 20 years for a workforce that has collected a bit, almost $2 billion in taxes and fees to the city of New York and to the MTA. This city owes gratitude to the men and women who have served close to 500,000 people every single day. We can get this done. Council members- Time expired. Delay is going to lead to utter devastation. Please push for the plan right now. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now circle back to see if we can get the two um, individuals who were unable to um, on the panel before. Uh, Richard Chow, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Okay, still having technical difficulties. Jana Stroh. Time starts now. Yes, we can hear you. Can you speak louder? Yeah, I, I'm typing. Yeah, I'm typing. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. I'm going to get some place. Hello? What's the problem? Hello? Hello? Is that working? I'm sorry, unfortunately, we're having difficulty hearing you. Your audio doesn't seem to be coming through. We will circle back after the next panel. Um, 
to see if you can get back on. Um, I'm going to turn it to Chairman Taka and Chair Chen for any questions. Uh, I, I do not have any questions and, and really a recommitment to sitting down uh, and getting a sense of it. I think we have um, uh, Baravi who spoke as well, and we want to, I want to sit down with you. Uh, and, and I think too, somewhat just a continued focus on our elder immigrants in New York City who are working, who are continuing to work, who need services. That is what this, that's, that's what this hearing is all about. Uh, and so I'm committing to ensure that we leave this hearing with a sense of a plan and a sense of the gaps so that we can fill them. Part of it is going to be budget and the other part is going to be policy. Thank you. Oh, and I want to say thank you to Nick, uh, uh, the director at Moya, who is still here today and said just thank you so much for, for being uh, present the way that you are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Chin, any questions? No, I just wanted to thank this panel. I, it's just heartbreaking. And I, I guess along with Councilor Manchaka, we will do everything we can to really bring some justice to this issue for the taxi workers. Um, and then we have to work with uh, the mayor uh, to get it done. And if it's a, a solid plan, then if there's a solution there, then let's work and get it done. So you have my commitment on that. And I just wanted to make sure that, um, that the taxi drivers also know that there are resources out there, whether it's a get food program, whether it's a, the care program for health insurance. And I'm sure that the Taxi Worker Alliance is, is helping you. And we just wanna make sure that whatever resources available uh, that you are able to access that while we work on the solution of the, you know, the death um, bailout program. So thank you again. Uh, maybe for Jana, is there a phone number that maybe she can call in um, so that we could hear her testimony if the video is having problem? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as a reminder for anyone who is unable to testify today, um, please uh, submit written testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And we will be including it for the record. Um, we're gonna move on to our next panel. Um, in order, I will be calling on Joseph Dejante, Mustafa Albasai, followed by Gerson Fernandez, followed by Basia, Osauki, followed by Dorothy Leconte. Joseph Jajaute, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts yes. now. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joseph Jajut. I am a member of the New York City Taxi Worker Alliance. I'm 64 years old and I'm a resident of Canarsie, Brooklyn. I immigrated here from Haiti in 1977, at the age of 21 years old. I bought my medallion in 1988. And for over 20 years, I drive, working long hours and making decent living. That all changed when the city let Uber and Live come in and take the market from us. I'm, I'm now almost half a million dollar in debt million dollar in debt. I come to this country to make a better life and working hard <clears throat> to make a better life. Working hard, was able to buy a house, but now what we have to get, debt for, we need a debt forgiveness. Now, that could be taken away from me and my family. They have already stole my retirement. I suffer high blood pressure and I tie twist. I no longer work the long hours <clears throat> I used to do to pay all this debt. The government allowed this happen. Uber has I made a million, but we now hold the bank. The city must do something for the minority people like us, the taxi driver. I think I love the city of New York. 
I come in here when I was a young boy. I, I never moved from Brooklyn. I still, and what we need now is a deaf forgiveness. It's the only way we can survive. I think now the great mayor, the great council of New York City, please turn your head down, turn your head down to look at the poor immigrant people like me and a thousand of us. I think now enough is enough, Mr. Mayor. Enough is enough. That's why we're looking for, please, the council, open your heart to look after the poor people like we immigrants. All our blood is in the streets of New York City. We drive like a slave to make it, to get a better life. That's what happened to us. Now, I think we got the power to do the good thing for, for your senior citizens. I, I would like to say thank you to everybody who share this commitment today. Please, please again, do something. Do something again. Please again. Thank you and God bless the city of New York and God bless America. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Mustafa Alab uh, Alabsi to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear my, you. Yes. Debt forgiveness is my hope instead of suicide. I am Mustafa Alabsi, 68 years old started driving a New York City yellow medallion taxi in 1996. I loved it very much and I, I thought it is the very good path destiny for excellent and secure retirement. So in 2008, I decided to purchase my yellow taxi medallion for about over 600,000. I was fully confident and I purchased a very secure, regulated and protected business by the city of New York City for all the street hire transportation, taxi business. At the beginning, it was good. I worked hard, long hours to fulfill my two jumbo loans, monthly payment responsibility. In 2014, because I was worked hard, long hours, I ended in the hospitals. I had two major heart open surgeries. I went back to work at the beginning of 2015 to catch up with my late payment obligation. But I found the taxi business declined by the having competitions from other less expensive sectors. The app companies, companies who were allowed to work by the city for free. Again, in 2017, I ended in the hospitals having stress high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes, which add more illness to my health at this age. It is hard to work comfortably in this state of health at this age. At the, at the present, my taxi medallion worth less. My business I purchased from the city went free to other competitors, sectors I cannot make good living. I cannot make the medallions monthly loans payment. So the lenders will take my house. My fear at this end, I will be homeless. God forbid. I would like to ask the city mayor, the other city officials, all senators, Dad Somers, congressmen and congresswomen who feel our pain to fulfill their promises to act now and include us in the coming stimulus bills and work with, other, with our T, WTA union for the debt forgiveness now as it was proposed by our <coughs> TWA 125,000 and cap the monthly payment at the length and make the length longer for the loan because the yellow medallion time expired is not going to be as it was for because of the COVID-19 is not ever yet and the business is not going to be as it was ever. Thank you very much and take our suggestion and work with our union. Thank you everybody and bye-bye. 
Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Gerson Fernandez to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me a chance to testify. My name is Jerson Fernandez. I'm 67 years old. I'm a yellow taxi driver owner. I started driving in 1999. I bought my medallion in 2003. I made my payments on time from 2003 till March 2020. In those, in those days, the taxi industry was a good job. When you could make a decent living and you could take, take care of your bills and family, we were about 13,000, 500 yellow cabs. And we could make money with the customers we had. Later in 2014 or 15, the city allowed Uber, Lyft, Via, and the app companies to infiltrate the taxi market. In course of time, the black cars, Uber, Lyft, Via, etc., total 100,000 cars. The taxi industry is completely disrupted. We yellow taxi owner drivers find it difficult to pay our bills. Mortgage on the taxi medallion taxi insurance, credit card, day-to-day -day expenses, et cetera, et cetera. All these bills pile up and no money to earn. Please try to help us out now. Make up for the past mistake of letting in the app companies, Uber, Lyft, Via, et cetera, who dismantled the taxi industry. There is a solution to this. I belong to the New York Taxi Workers Alliance our leader, Ms. Bhairavi Desai, has a very good and practical proposal for the city to follow. This proposal helps the city and the yellow taxi owner drivers. All the loans are brought down to 125,000 for all owner drivers over a period of 20 years and a monthly payment of 757 a month, which is practical to pay. Please get our union leader to the bargaining table and please discuss with her. This is the only way we can get back on our feet. And the iconic yellow taxi is back where it belongs. Please, please help me and all the owner drivers. Imagine I'm still working at 67 and I love it. Please get- I'm expired. Please get the yellow taxi industry back to its feet so that we can make our living and pay our bills on time. Thank you very much for giving me the time and listening to my witness. God bless and have a good day. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Basia Osalki to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me? Uh, good afternoon. I just would like to emphasize that we are in this pre uh, predicament today because of the corruption and the top of the government of New York. In 1937, our grandfathers formed that taxi alliance to allow the immigrants to build their retirement, their children's future. Unfortunately, we were robbed a few years ago by the city of New York. I am a taxi driver for 
close to four years. I was proud honor till last year of yellow taxi medallion. Unfortunately, I am losing everything. Now I am facing almost losing my house because of the predatory loans and uh, the whole nine yards what the city and the lenders work together at. So please help us somehow to have the right retirement. Yes, once upon the time I was young, but I was thinking about my senior years. And I believe I do deserve decent living, which I don't have to struggle. I never ask uh, uh, the city for help. But now, because they rob us, they are obligated to all individual taxi owners medallion a uh, help. Uh, uh, really, uh, I am speechless. So many guys already suicide. You know, day to day we are thinking who next because we cannot take the pressure. This is totally unfair. So I would like to talk about this subject for a long time, but I know the time is limited. So I will just emphasize again, make people responsible who make the robbery in the daylight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dorothy Leconte to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Dorothy Leconte, and uh, I've been a taxi driver for 34 years. Um, well, I do not want to repeat myself like everybody else. Uh, you heard all the guys and the ladies talking about our retirement, our uh, old ages. We all work very hard. Like they said, I work very hard. I did not expect right now for me to that to be in that situation where we're wondering the next day or the next month are we going to survive. As you know, uh, with the COVID, when the gentleman said, I used to work and pay my mortgage, no, no retirement, uh, no, no late fees. My mortgage been taken taking away from the broker every week. I used to pay my mortgage breaking down weekly. Weekly payment goes normally until March, March 2020, the COVID come out. As a matter of fact, I do love somebody who's very close to me, which is the father of my son. The first week of COVID, the gentleman passed away with COVID disease. So leave my son devastated. He's very stressed out. He can't continue going to school because one father, one, 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 one son. He cannot believe his father died with COVID. And I also got the bug in my back because I have no money to support my son. He has to quit school to go working and get a $16 an hour where I was putting my money to, to edu his education. Right now, we are in the situation where, even though I have the problems, I have problems myself, but I've been hearing all the friends who are even worse than me. People having heart disease, people got uh, uh, have open surgery, people got uh, a lot of problems at home, and they're calling me days and night, Dorothy, what are we gonna do? I have a conversation with the mayor on Friday. I did ask him this question. When is going to help us out? Because he been promising many times, I, I met Mayor de Blasio, he promised that he will save her retirement. 
he will save our retirement. But he still doesn't do anything. Right now, he said the last time he didn't have money. But now I know we're going to have some money from the stimulus. We, the part of the small business, they are the one who put us in this trouble. They have to help us out. I'm sorry. They do need to help us out. So I am begging you, please talk to the mayor. Let everything go on the table because our, pro our project, 125 750 a month, they could reconstruct the medallion business, and we could have our lives back together. Please. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> I'd like to ask if council members um, Minchaka and Chin have any questions. I just want to say thank you again uh, for your testimony. Each of you have your own story that needs to be heard. Um, and I'm going to go back the invisible nature of our elder immigrant workers has to stop and we and that's what this hearing is about so thank you so much and i look forward to hearing more thank you chair uh chair chin i also wanted to just thank the panel and thank you for telling your story and I think you, you can count on us to really advocate for you because what you are telling our immigrant stories and what happened is very, very bad, unfortunate. And we cannot let this tragedy to continue. So we're gonna work together and really work on the solution. So hang in there, okay? And continue your advocacy. Don't give up, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. We'll now be moving on to our next panel. Um, in order, I will be calling on Herban Singh, followed by Vito Lanza, followed by Ajith Bharth, followed by Ricardo Lopez. Herban Singh, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Yeah, this is Herban Singh. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Yeah. This is Harban Singh. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, I bought my medallion in 1987, and uh, it's like a 32 year, 33 year, and I'm a taxi driver all the time. And now, after the Uber came in and the Lyft came in, the apps company led a 2014 I'm stuck with the debt. So I hope uh, people can uh, help us, all the taxi drivers. I am uh, from the Alliance Union uh, Taxi Workers. And uh, I'm uh, badly stuck. I'm 71 year old. I lost my all my retirement. Please help us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Vito Lanza to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I believe we're having technical difficulties, so I'll move on to our next panelist and we'll circle back. I'd like to now welcome Ajit Bharat to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Okay. Time starts now. Hello. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah, this is Ajit Bharat. Yeah, I'm like 67 year old and looking for the retirement benefits. Uh, this age is not for the work, you know? This is for the rest at the home. Uh, we give the lot of money every month to the city as it MTA tax improvement, surcharge, congestion price. But now I'm out of pocket. 
is very hard to put the food on the table for two time every day so please every one need the help you know when the lenders phone make the phone call we can't reply them is very hard. impossible to do it let's talk my son can talk with you hey um i'm just representing my dad um so essentially what he's trying to say is that he's 67 years old he's worked for the city for 20 years probably service at least 120,000 new yorkers and if you think about it for years he's been paying the mta tax the congestion tax the uh, improvement surcharge and per ride that could be anywhere from 30 to 60% of the actual income that he was making which is ridiculous when you think about it in the context of what percentage of income do corporations pay amazon uh or or even small businesses this small business was squeezed from both the city and obviously from uh competition from uber and these are 65 60 70 year old people with $400,000 in debt and trying to think about how to live the last like decades of their life through debt if you think about it you also have a uh, a responsibility of the city to make sure that all the income that these people provided through physical labor to the city any other job you would be investing that money in a 401k it would be you know appreciating it would be a path for a white collar individual to retire and what we're imploring city hall to do is to think about the working class to think about the promises that were made in the early to, uh, uh, 2010s why people ended up taking exuberant loans because they had the comfort of you know this is a, a million dollar asset and then allow rampant competition from uber which other co- uh, cities in the world did not do you know london protected its tax drivers new york city did did not so it's not just free competition uh, uh, free markets at that point it's more about what are we doing as a city to treat our working class and pr- contextualizing that from the from a tax rate perspective and saying they've paid the city for two decades three decades what is the city going to do to have their back at this point is there anything else you want to say no so he can the was receive karo karo lenders ko phone karte hain problem ho rahi hai yeah and as you can see he was a bit emotional cuz uh Lenders. one of the unspoken aspects of this entire uh, uh situation is the anxiety it induces for anyone that's been consistently working 10 hours a day for uh for decades and still not have the financial security to uh to retire comfortably and having lenders uh threaten bankruptcy and thinking about what does that mean for their financial future if they have to declare bankruptcy so again there's been two like all of that is the underlying as uh foundation for why there are so many taxi driver suicides over the past couple of years and this is one a financial obligation i think the city has towards its working class to um mental health obligation that the city has towards its working class So that's all essentially we have to say. Um thank you for your time and I really ho- hope that the city of New York um who prides itself in being uh a working class city and being represented by a multicultural um community where 70% of of New Yorkers are non-white we actually put our money where our mouth uh, mouth is and actually help people with diverse backgrounds as opposed to just the corporations that I work for I benefit from but to see my father struggling in his old age I cannot imagine the outrage I would have at the city if the city treated me like that and there's not a level of entitlement that the older generation has that the younger generation definitely has and that does not mean that we would exploit the older generation it should mean that we actually like step up to the plate and help them in their time of need So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh you guys can take the mic back. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Ricardo Lopez to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Oh, hi, I'm Ricardo Lopez. I'm 69 years old. I came from Colombia with my wife. I got married in 1973. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I thank every one of you for listening to all of us, okay? Thank you, thank you for listening to all of us. I re we really appreciate it. Uh, I went to law school in Colombia. I came here, but not, not thinking that I was gonna stay. I liked it so much and I stayed here. So I bought my taxi in 1980 and uh, I've been driving 41 years so far. I went through column cancer also. And it's amazing how the economy is going with all of us. We are literally, literally going out of bankruptcy. I'm probably next in the line to commit suicide. And it might be in front of uh, de, Blasio's, uh, de Blasio's office. I don't know. I have no idea yet because the thing is that it's so hard to make money these days that everything is closed. All the... Uh, hotels are gone. Most of the major hotels are gone. Most of the uh, businesses in New York City are also closed, restaurants, everything. Nobody is taking yellow cabs anymore. I worked, even though I'm still working because I want to keep on supporting my family, paying everything at home. And all I'm making $120 a day, $120. I don't know where we're gonna go with this without the, uh, without the, uh, what do you call the, uh, the uh, help from the Vlasha and every, every one of these official people that are out there. We are right now heading and closing the Brooklyn Bridge. I have no idea what is closed, I believe. And, uh, and uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to tell you that uh, please help us, help us to get this this debt forgiveness, please, to pay, to come down to 125. I owe, I owe almost $500,000. I don't know how I'm gonna be paying these people's money, uh, the monies that I owe. Anyways, I really, really, really appreciate us. Help us, please help us because I'm, uh, I don't know where else to go. I have no idea. We, we, we I've been working 41 years. I went through cancer and uh, my leg is gone already, my left leg, because I've been sitting 41 years in my cab. My back is all crooked because of it too. Uh, I used to sit 85 hours a week. Now I'm sitting only, only 75 hours a week. So I don't know what else to do. Uh, I want you to please help us, otherwise we're gonna go out of business soon. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Vilo, Vito Lanza to see if you're able to get him back on. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Vito Lanza. I've been serving New Yorkers for 43 years as a medallion taxi driver and own my own medallion. I am 65 years old. I can't afford to retire due to scam and discrimination. I don't have any debt. My medallion is my only asset in life. I never borrowed on it to buy any property and I don't have any savings or pension. Recently, I was in Mount Sinai, Beth Israel Hospital for 19 days with COVID-19 pneumonia. 17 of those days, I was on oxygen to help me breathe. My lungs may never fully recover. I'm still sick and have problems breathing. It would be inhumane for me to work 12 hours a day, 60 hours or more a week at my age and condition to make a living driving a taxi. The TLC was auctioning medallions for over $1 million. Then the TLC allowed the 100,000 app services to come in for free and destroy the value of the medallion, which they were selling for over $1 million. 
they gave basically these app services a hundred billion dollars for nothing. And I'm sure there was a lot of bribery and corruption involved. I don't own a house. Why am I supposed to suffer by everyone wanting to destroy the value of the medallion, which the TLC was selling for a, a million dollars? The value of the medallion was my retirement. When they destroyed the value of the medallion, I don't have anything else. A lot of drivers, they buy houses for 500,000. And, and if, you know, and if they wanted to pay off their debt, they could just sell their houses. I don't have a house. I don't have anything. I just have the value of the medallion, which the TLC wasn't saying was overinflated when they were selling it for 100,000. Uber wasn't saying was overinflated when they came in. There was a sign on Van Dam Street guaranteeing drivers 10,000 a month that Uber gets 3,500 3, a month by getting 35%. That's 13,500 guaranteed. Does that sound like an overinflated price? I have a, a broker friend, Neil Greenbaum. He was able to rent taxis per shift, 750 a week. That's 6,000 a month. And look at the money it was generating. When, when somebody would get out of a taxi, somebody was waiting to get in. Basically, the, the, the city, Uber, and, and, and these officials created this conspiracy scam to rob me of a medallion that they were selling for over a million dollars. And I want compensation for it because I don't want to be punished that I paid off my medallion and everyone wants to make it worthless now. And what's the job? Five years you pay off. And yeah. Five years you pay off. And I, you know, I, I, anyway, thank you. What do you say? And anyway, senior citizens like me shouldn't I'm have- inspired. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to now turn it to the chairs for questions. Chairman Chakra. Uh, thank you, Armani. Uh, yet again, I want to say thank you to everyone who testified today. Um, and el mensaje para Ricardo López, um, si me puedes escuchar, muchas gracias por tus palabras. Uh, tienes el, el apoyo de nosotros como cabeza de, del comité de Um, de inmigración uh, y queremos hablar con ustedes y que, que siguen con la lucha uh, tienen tienen nuestra um, esperanza de que podemos llegar a lograr algo muy uh, justo ok, so, muchas gracias y si pues, se puede conectar con nosotros um, porque les queremos ayudar también con lo que necesita en este momento, muchas gracias I just also want to thank um, the panel and for your stories and and I remember, you know, as the, the last speaker was saying that, um, yeah, Medallion was over a million dollar way back. And I remember hearing during the Bloomberg administration, they were selling medallions to cover the city deficit. So I think, you know, the city needs to, to really step up and try to solve this problem and help the, the taxi workers who have contributed so much to the economy of the city. So we, we're going to work on this. And I, and Mr. Lopez and, and all the people who testify, I just hope that you stay in there, stay healthy, stay strong, and continue um, to advocate to make sure justice is done. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Um, I'm going to now just ask. Um, this this concludes our panels for today. I just want to ask if we inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and is yet to be called. Please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing no hands. I'm going to turn it back to the chairs for closing remarks. Chairman Chaka. <clears throat> uh, today was not an easy uh, hearing. We heard about a community, our aging elder immigrant population, and every testimony was connected to an incredible experience that our um, our local on the ground 
service providers that are asking for help from our city agencies. And I know that we're doing our best to the city, but it's just not enough right now. And we have a big role in the city council to play the role of advocacy and connection to the ground. And we heard from so many of you, whether you are a taxi medallion owner, uh, you are and, and a senior and have a family and, and so much um, was seen today when your family, your kids were here to testify with you. This is a family issue. This is not, this is not a medallion issue. This is about homes and lives. And so if this city government cannot wield its own power to support an immigrant that is a, an indigenous speaking immigrant who's in a line in Mixteca or a medallion worker who is um, an elder, uh, then, then I don't know what. And that's what we have to do. And we have the power to do that. And so I stand with our chair Chin and, and, the, and the work and the roles that we have in the city council to ensure that we shift our focus to ensure that those that have felt invisible no longer feel invisible and that they get what is uh, what they have earned. This is what the city has, has been about uh, our, our immigrants. And as they age in the city, uh, it is them who we need to take care of our elders. That's how I was brought up. Um, and I think that that is something that is well understood and known in our city. We just have to summon that power and courage to make that happen. Um, and so the last thing I want to say is thank you to Moya. I see Nick here. Thank you so much for being here. This is this is what government is. We have to sit and listen. That is the first step to making policy that is of the people. Uh, and so I want to say thank you to you and your team for being here. Uh, and we're gonna, we need to follow up on that data. If we cannot measure the things that we want to impact, we're not going to ever impact it. And I'm so thankful that the commissioner, uh, Cortez Vasquez, really heard that. And we want to follow up to ensure that not just the vaccinations that are immediate to people's minds, but that everything as we come out of COVID has a special understanding of our elders, our immigrant elders, uh, our New Yorkers. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chin. It's always a pleasure to do this work with you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka. Um, we have a lot of work to do. New York City is an immigrant city. And, you know, a lot of us came here looking for the American dream. And for a lot of the older immigrants, that's how they started. They want a better life for their children. And for a lot of the younger generation, we have benefited from our parents' hard work. And now that they are, you know, in the age that they should be enjoying themselves and be, you know, in retirement. And you hear stories of people suffering and stressing out uh, because, you know, they have all these worries and they're not getting the services and support that they need. And that's why we have to continue to make sure that they are taken care of, that our elders are taken care of. And that's a tradition um, that we grew up with. And so we will work very hard um, to make sure that you get the support. And I wanna thank all, all of you who testified today, share your story and, we're just gonna to have to work together and work hard to make sure that justice is done and that um, that our immigrant elders are being heard and that you're not invisible. So I also wanna thank all the staff who helped put together the hearing and all the sergeants who help us run um, these virtual remote hearings and we'll continue to work together. Thank you. And with that, we will close this hearing and follow up as we commit. Thank you so much.